Morning, Chair. That's us live now. Good morning, Clerk. Can you hear and see me okay? Yes, can hear and see you fine, Chair. Okay, thank you. So, thank you, members. Um, you know what? I will go to Will and say, Will. Oh, can I just ask everyone to put their phone on mute, please? We want to post it in the group because he. Colin, could you go on mute, please? We're hearing your conversation. Okay, members, thank you. Um, I call the meeting to order, and we are now online in our public meeting today. And thank you all. Can I welcome all of our members who are participating by video conferencing and remind members about the protocol for yard and use of electronic devices. So, members, uh, we have one apology to my knowledge from Carol Dillon. Carol has assigned her vote to me. Should it be required? Are members aware of any other apologies? Or clerk, are you aware of any apologies? Other than that? Sure. Okay, thank you. Um, so, members, a few items just want to touch upon briefly in Chair's business. The first is the joint meeting that we did yesterday with the, with the Education Committee, with the Children's Commissioner, Kula Yusuma. And just to, just to flag up that, that there are obviously considerable concerns around the impact that COVID has had on children and the whole area of CAMS and access to CAMS assessment and the impact that delays are having there in that system. Um, it, it continues to present significant cause for concern and, and something that does need addressed uh, quite urgently. The other event that I wanted to flag up for members was the VoIPIC event. So just to remind members that uh, VoIPIC are launching the report on the co-design of a series of standards for care planning and review meetings. Um, we are hosting that meeting and the event will take place in the Long Gallery on Wednesday the 16th of February at 11am. So that's in the Long Gallery at, uh, next, next Wednesday at 11am. I wanted also to just acknowledge the passing of the organ donation bill um, in the Assembly on Tuesday. I think it was uh, an absolutely massive moment for the, all those people who are awaiting organs and, and people who have campaigned for so very long. <clears throat> to try to get a change in the law, which we all hope, and I think there was huge support across the Assembly for the concept of pushing up the number, the, the organ donation figures. Um, I know that many people have worked on that in the past. Joanne Dobson, I know Joe Brawley as well, also worked with Joanne extensively on that. Um, and as, as it has been said before, myself and Pam done a very early meeting with the McGowan family in their campaign, the Donate for Dahi campaign. We were, I think, impressed, and I'll take you in if you want, Pam, for a comment in a wee second. We were, I think, very impressed with their activism and energy, and that it wasn't, even though their situation is so dire, and I think each and every one of us absolutely hopes that Dahi gets his transplant as soon as possible, but their knowledge of the situation, their knowledge of the problems, their passion for the solutions across the board came across to me on that day. And Pam and I did commit that we would do everything we could at that day. And, and I think we're, we're both delighted that we have arrived at the point where that bill has gone through the Assembly. Pam, do you want to say anything there? Thanks, Chair. Yes, just to say I'm delighted too that the, um, the organ uh, donation bill has now passed the final stage. I think it's very welcome. A lovely piece of news at this stage in the um, Assembly term. And yes, to thank uh, little Daly and his and his family for the campaign that they have raised, and and you know absolute appreciation of the fact that actually this doesn't directly impact on Daly because obviously under 18s are not included within the Dean consent model. But we what we do understand and have done all along that really the controversy around Dean consent is actually what generates the conversations uh, amongst other things but I think that's a main component and that awareness raising and just uh, ensuring that more people out there do actually have that conversation with their family to make their wishes very much known and ask for those wishes to be respected and I think that's a, a really really big point in all of this um, that you know it's, it's not easier it will to, of next year be easier than ever to opt out and I think people need to be aware of that as well because there are different differing views out there um, but I think people need to be made aware that it's going to be very easy for them to opt out just as easy as it is to opt in um, so your wishes can be very clear in that regard too but it's so important family can still override your wishes if you want to be a donor so it's really important that those conversations happen so that if you are one of those very small number of people who 
uh, at some stage um, may have the opportunity to donate your organs, um, that your wishes are, are really followed through. That's really important. So thank you for the opportunity to have a, a quick word on that, Chair. Yeah, thank you. And, and we, we, we send the committee's best wishes to everyone who is on a waiting list or waiting for a transplant and indeed anyone who is considering or in the process of, of doing a live donation. Um, we, we want to wish you all the very best and to hope that, they, that the, the opportunity that could arise from this legislation will be fulfilled and will see those rates increase and the people who, who would benefit from donation receive those uh, to, the, to the greatest degree possible. Because I think while there are certainly, and I, <clears throat> I agree there are certainly different views, I think there's massive support in general across, and this is just a, a way to um, maximise the, the potential of that support. So well done everyone, and uh, that, that's a great, a, great, a great piece of news and a great note to start off our meeting on today, I have to say. Okay, the final thing I just wanted to mention was that this is Children's Mental Health Week, and that was actually part of the reason why we were concentrating on that in a joint meeting yesterday. But I just do want to send out a message to all of those children who may be struggling or who may be feeling that things are, are too, too much for them. Please talk to someone. Talk to your family. Talk to your friends. Please do talk to someone. It is absolutely okay to not be feeling okay. Don't be one bit embarrassed to come forward and to say to somebody, I'm not feeling great. Um, so I just I just want to send that message out to everyone. We have also heard in committee, and, and it is it is absolutely the case that that uh, young children say it's okay not to be okay as well. But when you need a bit of extra support, please ask someone to come to to give you that help. And we will do all we can to work on on ensuring that the services are, are there for people as and when they need them. Um, so thanks for that, members. That's that's all in that. I'm moving on then to the draft minutes. And I refer members to the draft minutes of the meeting of the 3rd of February, which are tab 3.1. Um, are members content with those minutes? Yep, yeah, members content. And there are no matters arising, members, from them either. Thank you. So moving on. Moving on. Yes, go ahead. I'll maybe use matters arising for it just because I didn't get the chance earlier. But just on the event yesterday, I, I sent my apologies. I wasn't able to make it. But... Is there an update just on what the actions were as a result of, of that meeting? Or are we are we doing something given that um, the reports that have come through about the very passionate um, presentation from the Children's Commissioner? And I'm sure there isn't a one of us that doesn't go uh, awake without being contacted about problems of accessing timely treatment. So is there something, was there a, a, a sort of an action point from yesterday's meeting? Are we, are we bringing people in? Are we going to discuss it with people or we're going to ask questions or is there things that we can do to to follow up on that so i just i just checked with the clerk there in relation to that keith is there anything that was that was suggested that that would we would need you know action from the committee to follow the, up on the, there was chair the the joint committee agreed to write to both education departments and the health departments in relation to some of the key issues that were raised um, to get a response on on those issues, so um, that letter will be hopefully going out today to both departments to get a response on those key issues. Okay, yeah. well, sure, that would be useful. So, but uh, would it be a, an opportunity? Do you think, given the weight that's in it as well? I mean, would we be able to ask the minister to come and, and visit the committee on a single item of youth mental health? And we know that there is a mental health champion and others there, but could we? specific because you know the minister's not going to come along to a committee meeting and say he's doing nothing he'll he'll undoubtedly have something to come and discuss with us and it might help to give a bit bit of exposure um to the issue of mental health and we can we can relay the constituency based concerns that we have regarding access to cams and other services just to to keep it front and center that we can all work together on it okay um i'll, I'll, I'll check with the clerk again i know and and, and i know we have uh, requested that the minister, even in the short time that's left, the minister meet with us again at least once in terms of COVID and potentially another time in terms of more general issues. Maybe we would get more value out of out of a relevant, another relevant uh, department official because there are quite a bit. But I'll, I'll check with the clerk what his thoughts are on that just before I go to other other members or any thoughts. Uh, yes, Chair, as you said, we, we've requested the minister to come and brief on um we're hoping that's going to be on the 24th at the minute, um, but we're waiting confirmation from diaries and things like that. But um, that was in relation to a, a sort of a COVID update uh, and what's happening now. Um, certainly I could put the request in, um, so it can, but it just obviously depends the short time that we have 
um, minister's availability. Um, but I can put clearly that if the minister's not available, we would want senior officials to come and brief um, on the issue. So um, certainly we can put in the request and see um, the minister's availability. Okay, Pam, go ahead. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, and I wanted to back that call from um, Colin, really, because um, obviously CAMS is, is vital. Access to CAMS is vital, and, and we know there, you know, that it isn't sufficient, or uh, and it's wholly inadequate, I would say, uh, because I think we have we have too many um, children, young people who are affected by mental health, and they, they desperately need that access uh, in terms of an early intervention. Um, it, for their mental health issues. And, and these things need to be dealt with very early before it becomes a lifelong um, issue. So I think it's, it's common sense and, and a very practical thing to make sure that children and young people are being assessed uh, as quickly as possible after they've been referred. So I would I would back that call. And also I'm kind of conscious we're, forward, we're moving on to the forward work pro program almost, but uh, you know, the, those um, briefings around um, the transformation of health services have never been more important. I think we absolutely need to see that and, and the one on Encompass as well. Um, so I would back Colin's call to, to ask the minister and, and he's free to bring whatever official he wants with him. So I, I would ask the minister to come uh, and talk to us specifically on this issue. Yep. Okay. So members content with that and we'll, we'll ask the clerk to explore that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I think that's a good idea as well. Thank you. Okay, members then, um, moving on to item five, which is our briefing from the Health and Social Care Trusts. Um, they're here today to brief the committee on current pressures within health and social care. I refer members to copies of the Trust Winter Delivery Plans, which are tab five of your pack. So I'd now like to welcome, first of all, Dr. Cathy Jack, who's Chief Executive of the Belfast Trust. Uh, are you able to hear me, Cathy? And can, you see, can we hear you, please? Uh, I can hear you, Colm. Unfortunately, I can't see you, and I don't know if you can see, but I can hear you. Okay, we're not seeing you either at present, but we are hearing you clearly enough there, Cathy. So hopefully, maybe when we're going through the other panel, maybe whether it's your end or our end, we can get the, uh, the picture sorted. But you're very welcome this morning. We also have Miss Jennifer Welsh, who is Chief Executive of the Northern Trust. Uh, Jennifer, can you hear us okay? Yes, I can hear you, Chair. Good morning. Good morning, Jennifer. Um, and we're seeing and hearing you clearly, Jennifer. Thank you. We have Mr. Neil Gookian, who is Chief Executive of the Western Trust. Are you able to hear us okay, Neil? Yes, I can hear you loud and clear and I can see you. Can you hear and see me okay? Yeah, hearing and seeing both yourself and Jennifer. Fine, Neil. Thank you. Um, we have Melanie McClements, from, who's Director of Acute Services within the Southern Trust, uh, Melanie, can you hear us? I can hear you, thank you. Thank you, Melanie. We're not seeing you either, but we are hearing you at present. I'm, so I'm, thank on, you. I'm, on, I'm on audio because the system wouldn't let me link in by video, so I'm on audio. All right, okay, thank you. Thank you. We, have Nick, we have Nikki Patterson, who's Deputy Chief Executive Director of Primary Care, Older People and Executive Director of Nursing with the South Eastern Trust. Are you able to hear us okay, uh, Nikki? Good morning, Chair. Yes, I can see you and hear you loud and clear. Brilliant. So listen, that's, that's, that's everyone on online there. So I just want to welcome you all collectively. Um, appreciate your appearance and, and attendance at committee this morning. We all recognise that you're under massive pressure and um, that, that, this, that there's nothing easy at any time in health, but this is a particularly busy time of the year. And also the, the, the whole COVID scenario continues to present significant difficulties for you um, within, with the delivery of services. So um, I'll check back with yourself, uh, Cathy, if it's you that's doing the opening remarks. I know you've agreed that one, one of you will give opening remarks and then we go to questions and answers. So can I just check, but you're first on my list, who's doing that? Uh, yes, Chair, you're correct. I'm gonna lead on the opening remarks and then we'll all take the questions as appropriate. Thank you. Okay, okay go so ahead, Cathy, thanks. First of all, thank you um, for your invitation to address the committee on unscheduled pressures affecting us today. Members will be all too aware of our sharp warnings issued through the, war, the, win, the autumn and winter that we were a health service struggling to meet the demand for services that far outstripped our capacity. 
We spoke candidly to you about the difficult winter ahead on a healthcare system which was already in need of huge reform long before the pandemic. We believe the assessment to have been correct. COVID remains with us. Although the vaccination programme has reduced the number of people with COVID intensive care, there are still large numbers of hospital beds occupied with patients who are ill with COVID. In terms of our hardworking staff, it should be recognised that staff get ever more tired with each passing surge. Each surge seems to be more prolonged than the previous one, and the current pressure has been felt across the HSC system for many months. In terms of scheduled care pressure today, hospital and community services remain under significant strain. The main and exacerbated factor common to every area is the truly tired workforce, with additional COVID sickness absence and the long-term vacancies that we carry. You will know that COVID infections are not abating within the community, and outbreaks continue in care homes, which significantly curtails our ability to consistently discharge from hospital, and therefore it slows down the flow through our system. The community sector in particular is really struggling. Staffing pressures were always there, but with COVID at high levels in the community, demand has grown exponentially and we simply cannot meet. Many care homes are currently closed, either due to good outbreaks or due to insufficient staffing. And that members the safety concern and risk for each of us as it puts pressure on our whole hospital flow and leads to patients being backed up in an ED waiting on a hospital bed. Our staff worry about the patients being at home on procedure and about service users with unmet social needs in the community. And that is national stress on our staff. Each of our trusts have been responding to our own circumstances, but as a system, we have worked more collaboratively than ever to mitigate these, the impact of the issues and keep our services running. Moving through the winter, we established a regional critical care hub which has enabled us to, man, to manage the demand for critical complex elective surgery, COVID, and emergency and on scale pressures. We were able to flex up critical care capacity and keep COVID light sites or walls broadly secure. However, even with this forensic approach to surgery and intensive care, this has still meant a downturning of other elective procedures. Cancer services and cancer surgeries have continued, but it has required a daily balance of staff availability, management of risk, and better availability. Social distancing and burdensome PPE has slowed up work and has put additional barriers in caring for those in need. All GPR services exist on rotas and have gaps, and these are becoming harder and harder to fill. Emergency departments have become relentlessly busy. You, you will know that, that every trust has failed in ensuring those attending ED who need to be admitted have been given a bed in an acceptable time frame. We are all very, very aware that ambulances have been delayed at overcrowded EDs and some people have waited for several hours for an ambulance. While the impact of this virus has continued to hit us hard, I will say that the demand for intensive care has reduced, which is a clear outworking of an excellent vaccination program, and there are signs of staff returning to work as community transmission lessens. But I wish I could be more hopeful that our recovery will be quick. That is simply not the case. There has been far-reaching damage done, some of which we have not yet even assessed, and this is in the context of a pandemic which is not yet over. Thank you, Chair. We, we are very happy to take your questions. Okay, thank, thank you, Cathy. Um, yeah, and that, that, is, that is quite concerning. And I suppose the, the, first, the first question that I would have is, is um, 
are you actively are you actively linking in with the department in relation to how the any easement of restrictions is being managed and its impact on yourselves? Are you part of that conversation, or are these things that happen and then you simply have to sort of deal with the with the outworkings of it? How does that dynamic work at present? We regular meeting with the department. Um, there are several every week. Um, so we can escalate any concern and we work closely both with the board and the department on our day-to-day -day issues. Uh, and of course, there's always an open dialogue should any one of us have an issue that we'd escalate it immediately. So we work well, well together. Okay, and then you had touched or you had, you had mentioned the, the grave difficulty of staffing absences are creating across the system. So... What are your current options rates? And I'll quickly touch base with each of you in, the, in raising this um, to see if there's a similarity there. But what are the current staff absence rates across the trusts? And do you see those rates changing at present and improving? Uh, how, how soon do you see them improving? So I'll start with yourself, Cathy, and then I'll maybe go across the, across the so panel. COVID-related absences yesterday, we reported um, 1,104, which is just about 5% of my total workforce is currently absent the COVID alone. Okay, and with the gender, what's the other overarching rate, Cathy? So I've lost your audio there, Cathy. Overarching, our latest absence figures is 8.3%. Um, but I don't think that includes COVID, so we need to add on good on top. So that's our general and there's COVID. COVID in addition to the 8.3? Yes, that's my understanding. Yeah, so a total of a total of 13.3, uh, yeah. Um, I'll check then just on the order of the list that I have. Uh, Jennifer, what's yours in the Northern? Yes, so for the Northern Trust, um, the total absence, so that's all sick leave, including COVID absence, the total is 13.18%. So that's just over 1,600 members of staff off. The breakdown of that is for all other sick leave, it's 6.9%. For COVID absence, so that is people who are definitely COVID positive or who have symptoms, that's 3.74%. And then we have another 2.54% who are self-isolating and not able to work. There is a cadre of people then that we don't record um, who are self-isolating but are able to work from home. Okay, thanks Jennifer. Neil, what, what's your rates at present? So that, that question was Neil Guckian. Can you hear us there, Neil? You're on mute, Neil, I think. We don't have your audio. Apologies, Chairman. Apologies. Can you hear me now? Basically, our previous, are, yes. previously we had recorded 14% uh, 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 in the middle of the, the uh, re most recent surge. Our total uh, figure to the media was 14% absences, including COVID. Recently, that has come down somewhat. It's approximately 10%. However, the figure, uh, the, 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 the challenges we have, Chairman, is not the overall average percentage. It is the fact that we have pockets of teams who are experiencing significant levels of, 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 uh, of absences and thereby really impacting on services. So the danger when you quote average figures is that it, it actually understates the impact on services. Uh, so so I'm, I'm very loath to, to, to draw much reliance on, on, on average figures, Chairman. Thank you. Um, Melanie, Southern uh, Trust, Chair, please. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, our uh, average sickness rate normally sits around 5%. It's currently sitting in the range of 9 to 10% across the organisation, including COVID. And our numbers yesterday for COVID-related absence were 800 for the Trust. Thanks, Melanie. And Nikki for the South Eastern. Thank you, Chair. So our COVID-related absence is currently sitting at 5.4% and our non-COVID-related absence at 7.6%, given an overall average of 13%. Important to emphasise this does fluctuate. 
and you had asked around is it increasing decreasing we saw a slight downturn to 11 percent which was very welcome but currently we're at 13 percent and just to reiterate neil's point the devil is often in the detail when there are particular levels of high absence in some areas that can present a particular challenge okay thank you and um I suppose then that leads in, and maybe if one of you could some, give some indication as to, in terms of workforce planning, are where where are we in your in your to your understanding? Where are we in terms of an overall workforce plan that will start to address those those ongoing and chronic vacancies that we're seeing across the system? Um, and 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 in particular, I suppose one of the particular areas where this is having, I think, an impact is around the whole day centres. Um, and I know that 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 the, that was a problem even before COVID. So we need to see detailed plans in in detail in, in specific teams actually, Neil, like you're saying specific areas. Um, so where is the, the the workforce? I know there's a retention plan being worked on, but the overarch the overall workforce plan, um, where's that at in terms of your input into it and when do you expect to see a plan being being published? Well we can start maybe start chair uh, in terms of the individual. Just check. Yeah. Can you hear me okay? In terms of the individual teams, all our teams are drawing up contingency plans, Chairman, in terms of workforce and indeed services. So we a lot, at the moment, we're in the middle of business continuity plans to try to sustain services as best we can, particularly in those areas that are significantly adversely affected by staff absences. So that's the short term. In terms of the medium term, all, all vacant posts uh, within trust, we would have plans in place to advertise and to, to, to uh, have workforce plans in place to either uh, 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 attract people into those roles or to redefine those roles to make them more attractive to, to the to, uh, prospective candidates. In terms of the long-term uh, workforce planning, that, that is primarily a departmental uh, role in terms of strategically for the, for the region. Uh, we all will feed into a ver the various elements of that. Each each profession will have uh, will have its own strategic plan, and we have been feeding into that from from increasing the number of people in tra in training, uh, both in nursing uh, and, and medical, and indeed in, in AHPs, right through uh, to the to the other professions. So we are working with the, with the department on that. But workforce plans like that are long term plans, Chairman. We, we, there's no well, short-term answer. There's no short-term answer to this. Yeah, I, I under, well, I understand that, but this has been a work in progress for some time. What I'm trying to get to is there is there light at the end of the tunnel? Are you are you looking at you know from from your engagement on it? Um, you know, when would you hope to see a plan from the department? I suppose, Chair, if I, if I could come in. We are all continuing to work to the overall workforce strategy that was issued by the department a few years ago now. And as Neil says, particularly for those professional groupings, it takes some time for the increased numbers to work their way through. So if I were to use nursing as an example, whilst the pre-reg nursing numbers have been increased and that's been very, very welcome, it clearly takes time for that workforce to actually come out as registrants. And I think what we're facing now is whilst we were on a, a positive direction of travel, albeit takes time, COVID has then, of course, exacerbated all of the challenges right across the system. So it, it was difficult before we were in a positive direction of travel, but not as quick as we might have liked. And then we face the additional challenge that has been the last two years experience. Chair, could I perhaps give a, another example of this? Yeah, um, you know, so colleagues have described how we do try to work together with the department. Um, and while the, the intervening two years have been really, really challenging, there are things that we are able to, to move on with. So one example is I chair the Northern Ireland Pathology Network. We know we often have a challenge in recruiting enough consultant pathologists across Northern Ireland, and that's broken down into different specialties, whether it's cellular pathology, chemical pathology, microbiology, and so on. But one of the things, for example, that we have done over the last few years is recognizing that we are probably not always going to have the number of consultant medical staff that we need. So there we have, there we have looked at advanced training and new roles for healthcare scientists. So in pathology, we have created a post around advanced dissection. So these are for highly trained healthcare scientists who are now taking on some of the work that used to be done by consultant pathologists. So, so while, while we don't yet have a, a large overarching 
um, workforce plan, there are things that we all can push ahead with and try and make change as, as we go along. And I think it's hugely important that we continue to do that, working with our professional staff, looking at best practice elsewhere and taking opportunities to advance training and development for other staff members as well. Okay, thank you. And um, then in relation and just leading on from, from that, Jennifer, the, the BMA have identified shortages in consultants, um, 300 I think was the figure they put on it. What effect is that shortage having and how are trust recruiting uh, to try to address that issue? Yeah, so I'm, I'll maybe kick off in, in relation to that. Um, just in relation to vacancies within the Northern Trust area, so the, the overall vacancy across all staff groups is 3.67%, so it's comparatively low, And the, but the medical consultant vacancy is a little bit higher at 5.2%. I think we're relatively fortunate in the Northern Trust area at the moment, where um, it's maybe you know it's single figures in in staff groups. So it could be within the team of acute medicine that were that were one consultant vacant. It could be in the uh, it could be in surgery and there's one vacant. So I I don't have huge huge pressures in relation to pure vacancies, and I know I'm sure other colleagues would want to to comment. I think where where I have more challenges actually is less about the vacancies and more about have we got the right number of staff for the population that we serve. So the Northern Trust area is about 28% of the Northern Ireland overall population, but we do not have anywhere near that level of resource. And if I just pick out one area as an example, ENT surgery, when I look across all of the other trusts, there's about one ENT surgeon to around 50 to 55,000 of the population. But in the Northern Trust area, I have one ENT surgeon to 96,000 of the population. So, so there, there's a range of things that we look, have to look at in here. The overall vacancies, which absolutely creates a challenge for people trying to deliver services. And then it's also the balance of, have you got the right resource in the right place? And I personally have much more concern around that and very, very stretched teams who really don't have enough to meet the demands of the population that we serve. And how then, what's, what's your strategy around recruitment in that case, um, Jennifer? How well, that has, to be an, yeah, that has to be an engagement with the Health and Social Care Board because that's really a commissioning thing. So the board have commissioned us to provide services. They've given us a certain amount of money. We have recruited up to the maximum of the money that we have available. So we have to seek additional funding from the Health and Social Care Board. We have to convince them that we have great we have needs here that are not currently being met. And to be fair to colleagues in the Health and Social Care Board, that is acknowledged and they agree and acknowledge that there is a disparity across some of the trusts. That, that's not the fault of anybody uh, in position now. These are historical decisions. We're, we're feeling the outworking of that and actively working with colleagues in the board and elsewhere to try and redress some of that. Okay. Okay, um, go ahead, if a bit of a brief comment maybe from the Trust, because I do want to get to other members as well. So maybe a brief comment from each of you building upon that. Thank you. Go ahead, Neil. You're on, you're on mute again, Neil. Can you well, hear me now? Can, can you hear me now? By apologies, yeah. apologies yes. Chairman. In terms of the Western Trust, I would just want to emphasize that it's not just about consultant post. Of our substantial locum bow, 50% of our £22 million of locum bow is in consultant posts, but 30% of it is in junior doctors as well, and 20% is in middle grades. So there are substantial issues around our medical workforce in the West. Some of that is around uh, attracting people to the periphery area of, of the West. Some of that is around the workload, because if, if you have small routes, it's a substantially increased workload for, for staff. There are issues in terms of consultant workforce, in terms of uh, comparing contracts with, in Northern Ireland with, with the UK as well. And what's your strategy, Neil, for trying to attract people? We've we've brought in a we've brought in a major a major initiative for international recruitment, Chairman, and that has been successful to date. Uh, we are looking. Expanding that now into other specialties, we've been we've been able to attract international uh, consultants from uh, uh, into our in, into our hospitals to reduce our locum bill. So it has come down. Twenty two million is a is a very big figure, but it was a bigger figure than that in previous years. So that has been a successful strategy, and we are going to expand on that in the coming years. Okay. Do any other trust want to comment in addition to that, or you can 
Catherine, go ahead. Chair, just to say, for me in, in Belfast, one of the biggest challenges are the highly specialist um, training programmes delivered uh, with a tertiary centre. So you may only have you know, a group of six consultants, even at, at four. Uh, and how do you get the trainees through in its one centre and off they have to go away to finish their, their, their training? And then you want to attract them back. We have a medical workforce group in the trust that is absolutely looking at this and looking at the agency spend. But we also work very, very closely with the scenery uh, and with other trusts where in, in the likes of infectious diseases and that infectious diseases where we didn't have a stable rota at a point in time at a certain level given our numbers were so low we link across the centre of England so we always had and it's a bit like the paediatric all island cardiac network that we'll all be familiar with so for me I have a slightly different issue but we, we all will link with a centre either in the UK or in Ireland to make sure that we have sustainability in our, in our rotas but they, they don't even just take you know five or six years to train because that's what a student takes then it takes you know seven or eight or even longer specialist program after their foundation to get the the skills and competency need but we do welcome the second medical school we welcome the expansion both in nursing and medical numbers um, and we hope that in the next 10 years that will see that will see difference but is this is a long-term program a long-term program yeah, absolutely. And I think that is welcome to see those types of, and that has been raised with me recently, that issue about Chinese and the, the potential benefits of doing some more of that work across the island. Because obviously the less, the, the less far away people travel, the more the more chance we have of getting them back. Um, so I think that is... Okay, listen, I'm going, to, I'm going to move on because I do want to get to other members and I know there's quite a lot of questions for you. Uh, given that the, the Minister has recently indicated that he has signed off on the review into daycare centres, and I was acutely aware of shortages within daycare workforce and respite workforce, particularly in learning disability, even before before the pandemic. So the Minister has indicated that, that, that trusts are now working on plans to restore those services. And my question is, when can we expect to see them restored? And do you have the staff or are you working to recruit those staff that will be needed to fully restore centres? And, and I'm conscious that these go right across all of the areas and they are impacting an awful lot of people who are under a serious amount of pressure. So uh, as brief answers as you can, I know there's, there's a lot in that, but as brief answers as you can do, when you, when you can commit to having a restoration of services and, uh, and, and whether the staff currently exists to do that, to put those back. Cathy, go ahead. Okay, uh, thanks, Chair. So um, we have already undertaken another risk assessment. So just to be clear, Chair, many of our premises actually really struggle with our social distancing. Uh, and we have to take a risk assessment about can we reduce it safe from two metres. Uh, actually, what we find is largely we can't because these are vulnerable clients that we care for. So we're in the process of redoing all our risk assessments, looking at is it, is it um, less risky to reduce our social distancing, bring more people into day centres, etc. And we have the staff. So that there is a, a number of steps before we can open up. But we're already undertaking that work. But actually, at the moment, um, in Belfast, having done the risk assessment, we still believe two metres, given the infection activity of Omicron that, that we would struggle to reduce the social distancing and some of this is about our really our premises modernization how we can actually accommodate safely our clients in this area uh, but we are, are committed when we know and that it is safe to bring them back and some of that will be a state's work extra we will do that we are do, you have, do you have an indicative time Kathy a time frame for that well there's quite a lot of work to be done uh, and there's a competing priority, as you know, with our contractors, etc., around children's and maternity. So everything's in a finely balance. Um, there. So I can't give you a guarantee on time frames. What I can give you a guarantee is that we will do all we can to bring it back, and nobody wants to delay this. No, nobody wants to delay this. Don't worry thank, about thank you. families. Yeah. Thanks, Kathy. I'll just quickly run through the list then in the, in the order I have them again. So, Jennifer, in terms of daycare centre restoration of services? 
Yeah, it's a, it's a similar picture. Uh, I'll just give you some stats. I'll lift out one area around learning disability, uh, Chair, since you mentioned that. We're cr pr currently providing a service to 81% of those people who have previously attended, but they are receiving either less days or shorter days than they would have previously. So we have to acknowledge that. Um, a lot of this is also dependent on the guidance. Um, so as things change around guidance, around social distancing, around the need for bubbling as well, that allows us a little bit more flexibility. But clearly we have to be more careful than the general public, given the, given the, um, the vulnerability of a lot of these individuals. We are committed to getting there. All of the directors right across all of our trusts are working together along with colleagues in the board, PHA and the department to try and, and move this along in as safe and a timely a way as we possibly can. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, Neil, in terms of Western Trust restoration? Yeah. Same same picture as uh, as Cathy and, and Jennifer, uh, Chair. What I will say is in terms of the Western Trust current position, we are at 66% of previous levels. However, we would hi highlight that we have substantially increased our investments in day opportunities and uh, direct payments to, to families to support them through this difficult time. We're all committed, Chair, to... to, to to improve in our situation in care, care centres. But it's not just about the social distancing within the building. It's also in the social distancing and transport and getting to the to the building. We need we need to do this carefully over the coming months. Um, Melanie? Thanks, Chair. And again, just to back up, I mean, really our picture is similar across all of the trusts. The, the impact of social distancing on our daycare capacity and also the transport is raised um, with different profiles across um, learning disability, older people, different day centres, um, different um, levels of um, capacity. And the one other point I would um, make is the contribution that that adds to the stress for carers, because we are realising the impact on our carers and we're really keen to focus on this and getting back. We've had to redeploy some of our staff out of those centres at different points, but that is getting to a better place and we are focused on it. Okay, and Melanie, can you explain, because a lot of people out there will say, you know, how come we can see the removal of restrictions in other in other areas and reductions in social distance and that? So what's the, what's the, what's the so, the, and, and there's many of the, there's many of the day centre uh, and respite services that I don't think, you know, outside of learning disability, but what's the particular uh, issues there or why can't that be moved on um, more quickly to, to free up some of the capacity? And I think a lot of it, Chair, relates to uh, the understanding, the ability to social distance with some of our clients who aren't really that compliant with, with some of the rules and in protecting themselves and protecting others. Uh, that can create difficulties um, and just the availability to space within the available buildings and centres that we have is a difficulty uh, for us. And also the, the transport issue and how we transport safely to and from and what capacity we're able to deal with every day to allow us to deal with that. I think our health and social care, social distance and rules are probably still um, quite stringent. I know the general public seem to be step, stepping down a bit. Um, maybe our health and social care, um, social distance and policies are, are, are not um, fully stepped down um, in line with that. So that's something probably needs consideration. Okay, well, I'll just make a quick point, and I'll make it generally just to, to, to all of you. I was actually approached as recently again as last night from a community group who said that they would be prepared to work with the trust to provide additional space if for where that would be appropriate and assessed as being appropriate and safe. But um, I think there is there is potential there within the community sector maybe to look at how you could draw upon more space and if even as an interim measure, while because obviously it's a longer term there's a longer term task to to rebuild, you know, I'm aware of the, the case for Oak Ridge, for example, still hasn't been developed within the department. So those those are long-term projects. But I, I just think, and I will pass on actually some of them to the individual trusts where I've been approached by some groups uh, that are offering to work with you to provide some space. But I'm not, I'm not going to, I'm not going to dwell on that now. Um, so I'll move then finally to Nikki in terms of uh, Nikki, the the Southeastern Trust with daycare and respite. What's the situation? Yeah. Thank you, Chair, and I'm not going to repeat the relevant points that other colleagues have made. The only thing to add is that each of the trusts, as you, the committee will be aware, has to develop their rebuilding plans. 
and I'm pleased to report from a southeastern perspective we have been relatively conservative about our rebuilding plan for day centre services for all of the reasons that we've just described but we are performing better than what we anticipated in terms of our rebuild programme and trying to get back to baseline in terms of the the question around when we might be back to having full provision as it would have been pre-COVID. Like Cathy, I would be reluctant to give a specific date in relation to that, but there is a positive direction of travel and month on month we are seeing an improvement. Okay, thank you. So I'll go then across to members. I'll go first of all to Pam Cameron, our Deputy Chair. Then I have Colin, Paula and Deborah indicating. So go ahead, Pam, please. Thanks, Chair, and thank you to the panel for your attendance this morning because it's really important to hear from you um, on all of these topics. And I suppose just following on from the Chair there in terms of the um, issues around day centres and respite care, and I suppose it really does translate into all of the health care services. Uh, I would like to know a bit more about the isolation policies for, um, for trust staff and would like to know whether those have been amended to take account the change in um, governance guidance to the wider public on the length of quarantine, which of course is five days. Um, that was the first question. And, and I suppose on the back of that then, should there be further changes um, coming down the road in the very near future in terms of um, taking away isolation altogether? What impact would that have then on healthcare staff? And again, on the back of that, I would like to ask, while I'm no way, um, I wouldn't want to describe COVID as a common cold or flu, but hopefully we're getting to a, a stage where eventually that will be the case. So could, could you just tell us how um, in, in pre-pandemic times um, these kind of issues were managed, but obviously you don't expect anyone to come to work sick with you know very bad colds and, and flus so what you know what what differences are now to pre-pandemic in terms of those staffing issues um because obviously um there you've outlined the the staff absence which is a huge issue um and along with the, the social distancing issue as well and it's been referred to that need to to step down or step back or return in terms of social distancing i think it's really important that that happens as soon as possible because people can't continue to go on um indefinitely without those healthcare services that they so badly need um so i suppose in finishing that particular line of questioning um i would also like to um ask kind of around um, the close contact scenario with staff um, and whether it's still appropriate for healthcare staff not to be attending work because they are close contact, especially if they are up to date with their vaccinations. So that's my first one. Then I have a couple of quick ones after that, Chair, if that's okay. Okay, I do you would like to reply. I'm happy to go and then if other colleagues want to come in, so thank you for the question. Uh, just in terms of how the whole situation in relation to staff isolation and close contact etc is managed, uh, there is an infection prevention and control cell and a testing cell as part of the regional infrastructure developed for the management of COVID. So all of the trusts will take their direction from that cell in terms of having a consistent approach right across the region and as restrictions have relaxed within the overall community that cell then takes account of the current evidence and the current prevalence of COVID and reviews the arrangements for health and social care staff so there has been as we've traveled through this journey amendments to the arrangements and the requirements for staff in just the same way as there has been for the community however they would not be to the same level of if we were to use the word leniency as there would be for the community and we can understand why that is the case because health and social care staff are of course working with vulnerable individuals in very many of the settings in which they work so for example when restrictions are eased in relation to periods of self-isolation it may not be that there would be a direct read across to that period being eased to the same extent 
for health and social care staff that there is a reassessment of what is appropriate or otherwise. In relation to the question around uh, common cold, and it would always have been in the view that individuals who have a virus of any type, if they are coughing and sneezing, it is not a good idea for them to be in work and spreading their germs to everyone else. So in many ways, a lot of the good practice around COVID will remain for other viruses and perhaps reinforces some of those points across the community. But the, the very welcome review of self-isolation requirements, etc., for health and social care staff has put us in a position where we are... It, the balancing act for us, had it not been for Omicron, we would actually have perhaps been seeing ourselves in a position where things had improved. The, the transmittability of Omicron means that the sheer number of individuals who are testing positive then has a, an impact on the overall percentage of absence. So it's a continuous moving feast. But what we'd want to reassure the committee is that, yes, there is ongoing regional review of the requirements for self-isolation and in relation to where we have services that are at a critical point and it's back to Neil's point around high level percentage absences the devil in the detail of small areas where there may be a very specialist workforce and there may be for example if there are a considerable number of staff off in a very small area that can have a, a real challenge for that particular specialty or service. And in those instances, there is then a risk assessment undertaken and if members of staff have had their two vaccines and their booster vaccine, and there can be appropriate mitigations put in place, then that can be considered in order to sustain the delivery of the service. Chair, I would maybe just echo very briefly what Nikki has said. I think we would have been in a different position had it still been Delta largely that we were dealing with, but Omicron is, is different. Um, and I think uh, even in terms of what is publicised, we, we know that many people are either not testing now or if they are testing on their lateral flows, they are not uploading the results. So the true uh, number of people positive in our community is probably much higher than is officially reported. Um, we are, of course, reporting because our staff have to do this. I'm content with the arrangements that we have in place at the moment because I think they are appropriate in terms of keeping, um, keeping our, our patients and our service users safe. As soon as it is appropriate to move on, then I'm confident that we will do so because of that work that takes place, as Nikki has described, at a regional level through the, through the IPC cell. Uh, the risk mitigations are hugely important, so those risk assessments that take place day and daily are, are hugely, hugely important. And we are, you know, even, even on the, the current guidance where someone who does test positive from day five, if they have two uh, uh, consecutive negative lateral flows, they can come back into work. But, but having said that, we are still seeing people te still testing positive maybe day 12 and day 13. Um, that, that's maybe unusual, but it's certainly not unheard of. It's maybe 5 to 10% of people are like that. So the, the guidance uh, is, um, is important and it does capture all of those different scenarios that we have to deal with. Yeah, very, very briefly, if you can, Cathy. Yeah, just, just to say, I was having a look at our breakdown of our 1104 yesterday and um, 960 of them either were symptomatic had long COVID pregnancy related and therefore, you know, weren't able to come in at, at all because this is about contact tracing. Only 46 members of staff off because of self-isolation, because of a close contact tracing and they were probably waiting for their PCR, um, etc. to come back. So actually, the vast majority is either because they can't work because of childcare arrangements, because they've got a family member symptomatic, which is 98, but actually, overall, it's because our staff are actually symptomatic uh, and unwell um, with this. Now, it may not be uh, ill enough to bring our staff into hospital, thank God, but actually they are still unwell in the community and you would not want those people in um, caring for a loved one. They're not well enough to be in work. OK, thank you. Pam? Thank you, Chair, and um, thank you, everybody. Um, so just for absolute clarity, if you could tell us, 
how long uh, the quarantine period is for somebody who's testing positive and for a staff member who's um, a close contact. That's uh, And then I wanted to, I suppose on the back of that then, um, I want to ask around the, the, the vaccine uptake and that's not just um, COVID but flu because obviously the uptake of the flu vaccine in, in previous years was fairly low for healthcare staff and I know you had quite an ambitious target so if you could tell us what um, the stats are around the uptake um, of the flu vaccine and um, up-to-date vaccines in terms of COVID and then my, my final question Chair um, uh, would be in around um, what percentage of service users are currently awaiting discharge to domiciliary care and how this compares with the uh, with October when trust winter plans were announced? Thank you. Chair, I'm happy to start um, on that, if that's, yeah, that's helpful. Um, Pam, first of all, in terms of people who have actually tested positive, so the staff with symptoms or who've tested positive, the current guidance is they have to start a 10-day period of isolation from the day of their symptoms or the day of their test, whichever comes first. They start their daily lateral flow from day five of isolation. If they have two consecutive negative lateral flow tests at least 28 or 24 hours apart between day five and day 10, then they may return to work if they're temperature free from 48 hours and if they're feeling well. And they end that isolation immediately after the second uh, negative lateral flow. Um, but they have to continue to carry that out up until day 10 and as I say we do have examples of people who are still continuing to test positive beyond that. If their LFT result is still positive on day 14 they can stop testing and they can return to work on day 15 if they're temperature free for 48 hours and if they're feeling well enough. So what we're finding in practice is it is about day 10 before most people are getting back and for a few of them it is even longer. Uh, in terms of being a, a close contact of a positive case, obviously they have to not come into work, arrange for their PCR or, or a rapid test, complete a daily LFT for the full 10 day period. If they have ongoing contact with a positive case, um, then we have to refer into the risk assessment that they do. And obviously if they develop symptoms or a positive LFT, they go on to the other pathway. That, uh, that I have just described. So it's it's quite comprehensive what our managers have to follow to deal with, uh, with every single member of staff. Um, you'd ask there in relation to uh, flu vaccination particularly and the uptake um, in relation to, to that. Um, and what I would caution is many more people this time around have had their flu vaccination at their general practice uh, as opposed to within the trust. So I'm actually going to give you some COVID stats as well because this is important. We know in relation to um, the first dose of the vaccination, 86% um, 80, of our staff were vaccinated in a trust clinic, but some of those staff were vaccinated elsewhere. Uh, for dose two, it was 82%. Uh, and for the booster, it appears that it, it's only 44% in the trust clinics but we're actually going through an exercise at the moment where we're asking all staff who have been vaccinated elsewhere to let us know about that. So, for example, I myself had my COVID booster and my flu vaccination with my GP on the 1st of November. So what I've had to do is to complete a, a notification through to our occupational health department to make sure that that's captured. And we know that not everybody has done that yet. So what I can tell you is from a flu vaccination percentage, um, at trust clinics, 27% of people have been vaccinated, but we are currently getting a lot of data in from people who have had that vaccination elsewhere, primarily with their GP. And apologies, Pam, I know okay. you've one other bit that I can't quite remember. <laughs> it was around the uh, domiciliary care, so um, what percentage of users are currently waiting? Um, discharge to domiciliary care and how it compares with um, October when the um, when the plans the trust plans were announced okay so I can't give you a specific uh, percentage on 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 that but what I can tell you it has certainly gone up um, since the before our winter plans were published and that is primarily due to absences both in our own home care service uh, within the trust and within the independent sector domiciliary care providers uh, that we have used uh, as well. 
Um, we have been recruiting in that space, as have the independent sector as well, and we are starting to see it ease in some areas, but it is patchy. So there's four different localities in the Northern Trust area. We're seeing variability across those different areas, just as people are struggling. And it is very, very closely aligned to the community transmission in particular areas. And for all of the reasons that I've just outlined, then staff, uh, staff in the independent sector also having to self-isolate as, as well. But what I would want to assure you, what we're trying to do as well is maximise other opportunities. So if dawn care is not available, as you know, we've been trying to ask people to go to a nursing home for a short period of time or to an intermediate care and step down bed. And one of the things that we've done in this area is to vastly increase the number of step down beds that we've had available and we have had a block booking arrangement with some of our care homes where we've encouraged people to maybe go to a care home for a five or seven day period until such times as we've been able to put a domiciliary care package in place. Okay, could I ask if that's been effective in terms of the step down? Jennifer? Yes, it has, and it's something that we will continue to do. Um, what we have found is because we've been able to block book and work directly with those, those care homes, we've been able to specify in great detail the type of bed that is going to be needed. So uh, people who have a, have a dementia or specific needs, what we're finding is a lot of the people who need to be discharged from our hospitals at the moment, there's an increased number of people with levels of complexity that require more one-to-one -one nursing. So we have been able to specify that with those care homes and been able to discharge more people in that way. So it's certainly been very useful and it is something that we will continue. Thank you, Jennifer. And Chair, it might be worth, I don't want to hog any more, but it might be worth getting um, some more statistics from the other trust areas uh, around the domiciliary care issue in particular. Thank you. Yep. Are you, are you asking you. for those to be sent through to us, Pam, or do you want to go through each of them now when we're here very quickly? Or would, would uh, it be better uh, getting it, get it sent through in writing? Both would be nice, but I'll leave it up to you, Chair. Okay, well, maybe I think just for the purposes of accuracy and just, just so that people can go and, and check the figures, could each of the trusts maybe send us back the information in relation to Pam's question there, please? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Members, moving on then to Colin McGrath. Go ahead, Colin. And then I have Paula and Deborah and Jerry. So go ahead, Colin. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, panel, for uh, coming along today and giving us the update. Um, I know that probably some of the responses that I'll get will refer to workforce planning, and I just wanted to comment that um, you know, just how critical it is <clears throat> that the department does something. Um, because when I look at the uh, references earlier, you know, saying that it takes five years to train somebody and then there's some clinical experience that's required afterwards, we've been listening to that for 10 years. And the department needs to act to give us those people that we then start them on their journey. Because when we were first making these remarks, uh, 10 years ago, if there had been action then, we would have had the additional workforce now to be able to respond to the problems that you as trusts are facing. So um, I think it really is uh, important in that workforce development element that we take our opportunities to question the minister as to what the department's actually doing about it, because it will take five, seven, 10 years to actually resolve the problems. But I wanted to focus on emergency care. I mean, again, we right throughout this winter period hear again about emergency departments that are at their capacity. They, they are unable uh, to deal with the pressures that are there in a timely manner. And I was contacted by uh, one person, and um, it, I suppose it could have been anywhere, but it was Craig Alvin uh, Hospital, where I was told that there was 16 patients in an area where there was one toilet, and there was no shower, there were patients without beds, um, they found out afterwards that one of the persons in the area had COVID and then they were all having to be checked and go through the concerns that there were from that. And that in the waiting areas, there were very few people that were wearing masks. And what I was wondering is maybe if I could get an update from people as to what they've been actively doing to deal with the emergency pressures, because I do feel that we've got a, a first world uh, medical pr practitioners in our service but regrettably, in some places, they are dealing with third world uh, premises and resources and spaces to operate in. So what have you been doing over the winter period to stop us having these crisis points in our emergency care and emergency departments? Thank you. Thank you. And uh, yeah, as, as brief as possible. And if one person could maybe lead on that and then updates in terms of the, the other, if there are specific things to the other trust, please go ahead. 
So I'll start with you, Melanie, seeing as, as Colin referred to Craig Avon there, I'll go to you, Melanie. Thank you, Chair, and I'm happy to come in on this. And again, um, our uh, built environment and Southern Trust will be will be no surprise to you in terms of our two acute facilities and the impact that that has. We we have very cramped spaces. We ha have therefore very limited social distancing. We have lack of side rooms. We have lack of space. We have um, our, our bays, our multi occupancy bays, are actually uh, much smaller than our modern day spec um, would be if there was to be a, a, a rebuild. So there are lots of mitigations that we put in. Unfortunately, um, the the experience that you portray in Craig Avon isn't unusual for us. We suffer greatly with overcrowding in um, uh, emergency department in both sites and in Craig Avon there's some days we come in and there, there could be 100 people in the department there was this week uh, first thing in the morning and there was 48 of those waiting to, on a bed so the flow out of the hospital is a difficulty um, for um, care home placements for dom care all the points that have been raised earlier um, and therefore the flow up to the beds from our emergency department is a difficulty what have we done we have had an extensive capital plan to try and make the most of our current footprint um, over the winter. We are working actively with NED. We're increasing our space and moving out into uh, an unused courtyard to allow us to increase our clinical area. We are working actively to segregate our areas. When patients come in, they get swabbed and then they're, they are uh, segregated into COVID and non-COVID. We do ask all of our patients to um, wear a mask. Uh, we limit um, uh, visitors. Um, we have a visiting policy uh, restriction which is, which is increasing at the minute but um, isn't back to, to normal open visiting but even in the ED department uh, we advise families only if they uh, have a vulnerable family member um, would they be allowed into the emergency department, department to allow us to actually um, restrict our numbers. We've been increasing um, our, our range of, of segregation methods, whether that's cubicles or doors or, or use of, of different tools. And we also have a ventilation um, program underway in some parts of the hospital to try and improve our, our ventilated spaces, which is key here. And we work very closely with our infection prevention control colleagues to try and um, mitigate against, to risk assess all of our different areas and to make sure we limit our time in emergency department where it is with in our, our gift, access to um, available sanitary facilities at the levels within um, wards and departments is an extreme difficulty for us. We're very limited volume of, of um, side rooms in southern area in our wards and there also can be two toilets maybe available for up to 16, 18 patients which is unacceptable but that is um, what we're currently working with the department to get to a, a better specification for our acute services. Thank you, Chair. Yeah. Yeah, thank, thank you, Melanie. Uh, anybody want to add anything to that? Just very briefly, if you can, please. Yeah, uh, go ahead. Go ahead, Nicky. Oh. Sorry, it was actually Jennifer had her hand up. Jennifer, go ahead, please. Thanks, Chair. Um, a lot of the similar problems to the ones that uh, Melanie has outlined in relation to Craig Avon were slightly better served in terms of Antromedi around the number of single rooms that we have there, but it's simply the volume of people coming through and not getting the flow. And I would want to echo my real concerns, particularly about the Antrim site. Causeway is not just so bad. It is very well recognised that Antrim simply does not have enough beds for the population that it serves. Um, we're currently working with the department to secure funding for an additional 48 beds on this site, which are badly needed. Um, and that is necessary to, to ease the flow, to give us the space that we need, and particularly in this area, to increase the number of single rooms that we have on this site and the, and the toilet facilities as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Neil, go ahead. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Just, uh, and I'm not going to repeat what's already been said, but just for Alton and Gavin Hospital, we do have two streams, like all hospitals, red and green, for COVID. However, it's extremely cramped given the, 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 the space uh, restrictions within the Alton and Gavin site. But we do have a business case with the department to, to try to expand that to, to address those issues. In relation to, there's re a lot of regional work going on on patient flow. The only thing, extra thing that the West is doing, Chair, would be is we're looking at, we're doing reset days every month, looking at every single patient, all clinicians coming in er to look at, review every single patient to see what barriers are in place to flow. 
uh, to see whether or not we, we can uh, identify systemic improvements to actually assist in the flow. And those have been useful and, and we're, we're still working our way through the action plan on those. They create many, many actions, obviously. But that's, that's really all I would want to add. Thank you. Yep. Uh, just, just to say, we know we need to divest ED, so we we have an escalation area. I'm very happy to show any MLAs that are interested in it. It is not a ward area, but it is an area that we can decongest when we've done everything else, just to make sure that our ED remains safe and the infectivity risks around COVID. Uh, and the fact that if you've got a really crowded ED, you cannot see sometimes really sick people that need the critical care and treatment. We also opened a number of step beds chair um, because we know the flow into the community has not been what we want. I mean, I, I have 130 delays today, this morning, um, of which 99 are complex. And it's been like only two thirds are fast, as you'd expect, because of our regional services. A third are, are other localities re reflecting what the regional aspects of service are. And that is a huge problem for me. If I had those 132 patients who you no longer need in a hospital out, we wouldn't have a no crowded ED. The other thing we do, we actually pull out of our ED at 8 a.m., 12 noon, and 4 p.m. We have a discharge lunch where we actually seek to pull patients. Um, and we also have, in the real currently, because of our regional service, have a regional surgical ward where people may be in with other conditions like fractures, etc., or um, general surgery, but they're managed in COVID environment to try and protect our other services. Now that's not ideal because actually there's specialists seen there. It's not it's not ideal. But I have a lump, limited number of side rooms just like Jennifer and we constantly look at to see can we safely manage them in side rooms in our specialist area or do we need to go home. So actually what we're doing is we're doing the least worst thing we can do given the overall pressures across the HC system in the community and the private sector. Okay, thanks, Cathy. Cathy, we can just say your sound is a bit patchy. We are following you, but just be aware of that. Your sound is, is patchy there. I'm not sure there's anything you can do to improve it. Colin, if you have anything for there really briefly, please, um, and yeah. uh, if, there's, if there's detailed information, I'll ask the trust to return that to us by, by writing. Yeah, so go ahead, certainly. Colin. I'll not go with another question, but I suppose just to comment on back on that is that I'm hearing that there's there's lots of things that, that different trusts are doing. I just wonder, and maybe just to leave it as a point, if that's been shared, because there are some hospitals that we hear continually that there are waiting lists, and then there are other hospitals that we never hear of in a greater sense of, of, of having pressure. So I wonder just is there a sharing of um, strategies between um, different trusts so that they can maybe learn from each other and ways to do it. And the other thing was a number of the... Um, answers referred to uh, business cases that are with the trust. Could could you write back to the committee and give us a list of those? Um, because if they're in reference to ED, because we would certainly maybe as a committee, we could um, make representations to the department to get those sped up um, so that they would help you with your uh, emergency department work. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, and I did see uh, Jennifer was indicating that there is sharing going on, so that 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 is that is that is good to know. Um, I'm going then to move on to Paula. Paula, go ahead, please. Um, thank you, Chair, and thank you um, for the presentation so far this morning. I suppose I've got three um, questions. The first one is the um, comment made this morning, and I'd heard it previously um, around. The fact that um, consultants here are paid considerably less than their counterparts in the in GB. I'm just wondering, um, you know, the extent um, to which that is impacting upon recruitment and retention, and whether anything's going to be done or is being done to address that. The second issue is in relation to the long COVID service, um, and just really an assessment of how effective it is. Um, as health committee members, we've received correspondence from people who claim that they are travelling to Germany for more specialised treatment around vascular diseases, respiratory and car cardiology, etc. And then I just want to comment then on how effective you think the regional model is in terms of prioritisation um, for the waiting lists and, and whether that's still um, working well and whether it's being expanded upon. Thank you. Okay, so in terms of the pay, who who pick that one up, please? Could a member of the panel pick that up? Consultant pay? Well, 
Well, there's very little can be said, Chair. You know, we we know that the pay in Northern Ireland for consultants is by and large less than than the UK. I would highlight that the vast majority we've made great leaps and bounds in recent times in relation to the agenda for change staff. We're now by mar primarily on the same pay, I think as as England at least. Uh, so we're able to we're able to attract and and compete across the the majority of our staff. It is a fact that consultants, particularly. Uh, there's there's a long going issue with with uh, clinical excellence awards particularly. Thank you. Any other comment briefly, member Kathy? Yeah, go ahead, Kathy. I think there's also some like discrepancies in the doctors and dentists pay review being out of the recommendations, and there's also London waiting for consultants. So I think that that's maybe what the BMA are referencing here as well. There's like this discrepancy in what the doctor and dentist review they, they have a separate pay review body comes and looks at all the regions chair uh, and advocates um, a unified approach and my understanding is that northern ireland sit back a few years ago in that way team. but the t's and c's um, and the consult contract is broadly similar wherever you work but we we do not have the, the excellence award process at the regional level um locally that other jurisdictions do have Okay, thank you. And then on the long COVID assessments, and, and we are aware, and this is an issue that I'd be concerned about as well, we are aware that there was assessment centres set up. However, it's very unclear as to what the treatments are. So in terms of levels, Paula's question on levels of assessment and treatment for long COVID, please. Who will pick up on that one? Chair, and if I make a start, yeah. first can then contribute. Yeah. It would be fair to say that long COVID and its management is in an embryonic stage. Uh, and the services within Northern Ireland, we recognise it's welcome that a service has begun and that that service is in place across all of the five trusts. But we also recognise that it is likely that there will be considerable further development needed in relation to that service. And the, even not for by regionally, nationally and even internationally, it is still an emerging area. So there is not currently a blueprint of exactly how the service should look, and that's likely to continue to develop and evolve. I'm conscious of the perception that sometimes it can feel for individuals that there is, as you describe it, an assessment service, but then what about treatments? And part of the issue with COVID is the complexity with which it presents that it is not that one service would actually deliver all that would be required. So the current arrangement is such that individuals' needs are assessed and then they may be referred on to whatever specialty they require and what service they require dependent on their symptoms. But I think it is a service that is evolving and it is something that we recognise there is likely to be further investment required in. And back to Jennifer's previous comment in relation to our staff, we are finding that a considerable number of our staff are continuing to feel unwell for quite a period of time. And therefore, were we to use that as an indicator of the actual likely projection of the impact of COVID in our communities as we move forward from the pandemic. I think there is a view that there is likely to be a burden from COVID for very many months and years to come. Okay, thank you. And then in relation to the regional model, the prioritisation, how, how that is working, Cathy? So the regional uh, prioritisation operation group for surgery um, started uh, last January. Um, it's been steadily improving. It's been looking at issues around equity. There is further work to do to expand this, to make sure that we have regional waiting lists for many of our common operations and also for the regional operations uh, and to make sure that there's parity. So that whether you live in Fermat or whether you live, you know, in Down, you all have equal access. You might be tra traveling a little longer to a centre, but you won't be waiting as long. Um, so I think it's a really positive outcome uh, coming out of COVID. Great learning, and I, and I think that goes to show the collaboration, etc. That we've all been involved in, um, because it's no longer um, acceptable to have a postcode waiting time. 
um, for some of our surgeries. So there is more, there's been a lot of work done, but there is more work to do. I think that would be my sum up. I don't know if others want to comment on that. Yeah, just... Okay, uh, thank you. Paula? Sorry, go ahead. Who was that? It was me, Chair. No, it was just to, to echo that. I strongly support this, the work that's being done regionally. And for example, in, in breast surgery, I talked about the disparity in relation to population size and the resource to deal with it. So there's a recognised um, commissioning gap for the Northern Trust area of about 25% between the demand that we face and our cl clinical capacity to deliver. So working in a regional way to make sure that people have the right access is, is critically important. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Paula. Deborah, go ahead, please. Thank you, Chair. And I just want to thank um, the panel for their presentations today and also uh, to pass on our thanks as well to your members of staff who have had to work in very difficult circumstances over the last number of years. Um, I suppose, firstly, one of the questions I would like to ask, and I have three, in terms of workforce um, and particularly in relation to agency staff, um, we're aware obviously that there is huge huge costs in relation to agency staff and I suppose there is a dependency upon them um I think in 2020-2021 it was 282 million uh, it was spent across the trusts in terms of agency staff so have you raised that issue uh, with the minister in terms of the need to reduce dependency and to ensure workers are incentivized to work for the trusts and I'm looking particularly uh, Neil at the, at the West and you know I'm really heartened to hear about the work that is going on in terms of a global uh, picture in terms of attracting people but you know and I heard about that on Friday as well whenever I met with the Western Trust but how can we ensure students are uh, staying here and how can we ensure staff are incentivized to stay and work and trust so that's that's my first question the the next two will be short yep. thank you yes go ahead Neil. basically uh chair firstly we are collaborating across the region there's there's a, a group called the agency uh, Re uh reliance reduction uh work for a uh, group working group which which i've just taken over chairmanship of uh, and we're really looking the innovation lab for example from the department of finance are in advising us in terms of what interventions can we make to try to to reverse this 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 flow i think we're things are going to get worse before they get better chairman we're coming out of a very difficult pandemic staff are extremely tired staff are making different lifestyle choices than they would have made over the last decade uh, and people are, are reassessing their lives. I think it'll be it's a real challenge for employers of all sorts to to retain the workforce that they have. We will we will not be unstinting in our in our efforts to do that. We have to learn what what triggers that staff that staff have, which will help them uh, stay on on our payroll. It's it's ironic. The modern workforce are not interested in the same things as as people of my age are interested in. Uh, different age groups are different are, are, are have different factors in this, and we have to reflect that in our in our policies and our procedures. We are adapting, Chairman. Always in a large, complex organisation, you may not adapt as quickly as we, you know as we need to, but we are certainly on it. We certainly recognise this is a the biggest issue facing us. It's it's across all professions. And we, we are working really hard to do that. Uh, it's in terms of I know you're 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 referring to our neonatal work in terms of uh, Fermanagh, uh, Deborah, and uh, yes, we are going going worldwide in our in our, in our searches for for uh, qualified and service uh, nursing staff for to, to maintain our neonatal service. It's an incredibly challenging thing because it's there's a shortfall across uh, the UK and and Ireland and in relation to those roles. But we will not we we will not be uh, unstunting in our efforts to, to to fill those posts. Thank thank you um, for that, Neil and uh, I. Neil, I do want to thank you because you're putting an awful lot of uh, incredible effort in in relation to this, and and I want to thank you for that. Um, just just as well, uh, Neil, this, and maybe others want to comment on this as well. I know in the past we spoke about domiciliary care, um, and I'm just wondering, you know, obviously that has still been a bit of an issue. 
is our system in terms of domiciliary care broken and do we need to look at best practice elsewhere or you know are we doing it right because we we seem to be on a cliff edge all the time in relation to some domiciliary care um what more can we do instead of just uh, giving money to the sector and uh you know you know is there is there a model that we can change to ensure that it works for families and patients because again you know our family makeups have changed um and you know it's not as easy for people to to give up work to care for family members so uh could you maybe touch on that please chair i'd be happy to come in on that and if right. others then want to follow up go ahead so, deborah thank you for the question and you're absolutely right domiciliary care is such a pivotal part of the service and links very closely to all the conversation we've been having around flow so we currently have the reform of adult social care out for consultation as a region and in that there is a lot of detail around the proposed way forward and it refers heavily to the part of people document that was completed pre-covid and certainly it as you rightly say it is about more than just providing more money to the sector there's a great deal in that document around value in that workforce not just from a monetary perspective but it being seen as an attractive job it being seen by the community as something that is to be aspired to and recognizing as you say the difference in the community makeup in comparison to how things would have been perhaps in years gone by so there there is a huge piece of work around domiciliary care that will be pivotal to the delivery of services as we move forward and i think there are some really innovative pieces of work taking place across the region and back to us then ensuring that we learn from one another and scale and spread those so for example the complexities of actually delivering domiciliary care to clients right across i take southeastern trust as an example we have 5991 people receiving domiciliary care and colleagues and other trusts it would reflect similar numbers so it is a lot of individuals and actually coordinating all of that and within southeastern we're currently piloting a digitalization of that process so that it's no longer a manual process and that helps to make the system more efficient and to get more out of the very precious resource that we do have. That's one example of something innovative. It's also about providing those carers with the opportunity that they can actually self-determine to a greater degree what the client requires. And we often hear the conversations around 15 minute calls and 30 minute calls and a very task orientated service and it's about moving away from that to a more person-centered approach so there's lots of really important work in this space and it absolutely links to everything we've been talking about this morning yeah go go ahead neil as brief as you can please i'm, I'm quite conscious of time now yep. the states. go ahead Nikki's already outlined the, the regional context, but uh, given Deborah's from the West, I would want to highlight Deborah in, in the three months to the end of December, the Western Trust and its uh, as its providers provided 440,000 hours of domiciliary care. So it, it, yes, there are major issues. We're in the middle of the, an unprecedented pandemic, but there's still substantial services being delivered. It's the lifeblood of our community. We need to, yes, we need to review it. We need to do it differently, but we are doing our best to deliver services through a very difficult time. Okay. And we are, okay. I suppose, fin finally, finally, we we have stood down, as you know, we've delayed our, our, our procurement exercise for 12 months just to give everyone a bit of space and uh, going forward. Thank you. Chair, is it OK if I ask just one very brief, very quick question? Um, my, my last question was just, uh, has a projected activity in the HSE Trust Service delivery plans been met for October, December in the following areas? New outpatient appointments, cancer services, uh, CAMs and child protection referrals. Is that on each of the trust, Deborah? 
per perhaps it might be a good idea, Colm, as earlier, just maybe if if the trust could uh, write back just in relation to those, because I think it might take up a bit of time to go through each trust. So, yes, yeah. um, that would be for, for each of the trusts. Okay, so if I could then ask you all just to, to respond then in writing on that specific uh, details of those numbers. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Thanks, Deborah. Jerry, go ahead, please. Thanks, Chair. Uh, thanks, panel. Two questions. Um, the first one is obviously we've heard a lot of reports about staff leaving uh, trusts uh, and the healthcare sector generally. I mean, of course, there's many reasons for this, but the overriding one that I hear uh, is pay, uh, lack of pay, um, justice, uh, pay and equality, and paying workers what they deserve, despite them being clapped throughout COVID. Uh, so one of the asked chief executives, what input uh, have you had in discussions with the department uh, around their implementation of the 3% pay offer, uh, which is disgracefully way, way below inflation. Things are rising uh, officially above 5%, but things obviously uh, like gas and oil, much higher than that. So what input um, have the chief executives had in any discussions uh, with the minister and the department around that and their own views uh, on that offer, which I think is unacceptable. Thank you. Yep. Go ahead, Neil. Just uh, uh, on, a, on a small point, uh, Jerry, the I would highlight that the minister has actually topped up the three percent pay award for for AFC staff, uh, from ranging from one and a half percent for the lower paid staff through to half a percent to the higher paid staff. So there is a recognition that the three percent was 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 uh, wasn't as much as we would wanted to give. I I would highlight, Chair, that the the pay award to staff is based on budgets. And based on affordability to for the, for the health service, so we we do our best. We recognise the need for for uh, a fair a fair uh, wage increase. I think we've done we've we've come forward. We've come a long way in the last couple of years, and uh, since since the industrial action, uh, the, the staff in health and social care in Northern Ireland, uh, within uh, with, certainly within AFC can now see that they're actually paid in, in compar reasonably in comparison with England. And that was a major, major issue uh, in previous years. We are trying our best. I think, Jerry, in relation to the future, the, the draft budget going forward, this is going to continually be an issue for us. We do work closely with the Department of Health to see how we can manage our budgets in each year, but it's going to continue to be an issue in terms of retaining staff. But, and you're right, you're right, it is a major issue. Yeah, okay. anyone yeah. else? Go ahead, Jerry. Go ahead. Uh, thanks. Um, I think with respect, Neil, I think 1% and 1.5% on top of three is, is still way below inflation. Uh, frankly, it's crumbs. Uh, and I think it's disappointing. I think the chief executives um, should be more robust and challenging uh, the minister um, in that because it affects obviously retention and, and staff morale and staff remaining uh, in the health service. Um, my next question, uh, Chair, uh, we obviously have heard reports this week uh, of people waiting long periods of time on NHS uh, waiting lists, uh, but the same uh, patients being able to see uh, NHS consultants privately within a matter of literally days. Um, I frankly think it's uh, obscene uh, that such a bloated uh, um, private healthcare sector uh, is facilitated and allowed to exist here. Uh, to the panel, or the Chief executives on the panel believe that it's uh, unfair and not right um, for private health care uh, and that capacity, a two-tier system, that capacity that exists and consultants shouldn't be allowed to work in both uh, the NHS, uh, the trusts um, and uh, private um, health care. Yeah, who wants to pick up on that one, Paula? Okay, I'll pick it up then, Chairman. If no one else, if no one else, basically, uh, private healthcare is, is a, you know has been on the table for for many decades, Chair. Uh, I would say that uh, given the lack of the lack of inpatient beds, Jerry, uh, the the amount of in, uh, private work done in our hospitals is is very is extremely low compared to, to decades ago. However, yes, you're right. Our, our clinicians can have the option of working in private practice. This is extremely controlled. Uh, I can assure you every every consultant has a job plan, which and the job plan reflects NHS work primarily. So it is, you know, I, I can assure the, the, the committee that that is an extremely well-controlled environment. 
you know, I, I'm not a, I'm not proud of our waiting list, Jerry. In terms of the Western Trust, we have over 45,000 people waiting more than nine weeks for an outpatient appointment. We've have, we've have over 19,000 people waiting more than 13 weeks for inpatient or day case, and 1,300 waiting for more than 13 weeks for psychological therapies. But we are doing a lot of work. You know, the the, the media recently would suggest that what we're not doing an awful lot of work. We saw over 45 patients in our AHP services in the West in the last three months of the calendar year. Uh, over 21,000 people in our mental health services. Uh, we treated over 1,300 cancer patients in those three months and almost 6,500 day cases and inpatient operations in the last three months in the middle of a pandemic, Jerry. So we are trying to rebuild our services. I would highlight again as well our capacity really impacts upon us. In relation to the ventilation rules and, and in relation to the PPE donning and doffing, that reduces our ability for throughput in our theatres. In terms of a day case theatre, it impacts us. It reduces our capacity by 10%. It reduces our capacity in inpatients by 6% and out in the Gavin because of the less turnover of patients. So basically, we cannot operate at the same level as we did were able to before pandemic irrespective of the of the whole workforce issue and irrespective of everything else, even if we had all our staff in our theatres, we would still struggle to deliver the, the activity we had before the pandemic. But we are addressing this. We are working really hard to maximise the number of patients through all of our sessions. We're maximising our, 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 our activity and we're working with, with Minister in relation to the elective care reform uh, framework. So we are, we are working towards it. This will take many years. There's no point in pretending otherwise. It will take us many, many years to address our waiting list, but we, we will see it as a major priority. Okay, thanks, Ian. Thanks, Chair. Again, disappointing that there's no you know direct opposition to the, the bloated private uh, healthcare sector, which under, undermines the NHS and increases the two-tier system, but uh, uh, thank you for your answers. Thank you, Jerry. And finally, then, on my screen is Alan. Go ahead, Alan, please. Yes, uh, Chairman, just uh, can you hear me okay? Yep, here you are. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, look, uh, you know, there is a lot of media attention. It's just a comment I'd like to make before I ask my question uh, about the, the throughput of, of patients through the hospital system and uh, a lot of criticism. And, and it is, the waiting lists are uh, unacceptable. Uh, but I think that, you know, we should place on record our gratitude for the efforts of everybody uh, in the health and social care system who are trying their best uh, to reduce waiting lists and trying to treat patients. Uh, so I think it's important just to uh, acknowledge that, that it's that the health service is not at a standstill. Things are happening and people are being treated. But obviously, uh, we would like to see you know, more throughput. My question really is that there, there are doubts around the ability of the Department of Health to secure uh, a multi-year budget. Uh, due to the absence of uh, currently of an executive. Um, will this, um, if there is, if the minister is unable to obtain a multi-year uh, budget, uh, will this have a, a spin-off effect or a, a negative impact on uh, forward planning that uh, the trusts might have? Thank you. Yeah, go ahead, Neil. Okay, Chairman, uh, maybe I'll address this one first and my colleagues will come in. I think a, a multi a multi year budget is, is fundamental to the health service. We really need to get out of the you know the, the cycle whereby at the end of every year everything gets rebased and the reliance on non recurrent monies. Uh, I think it's really, really important and we would really work to, to try to keep that. However, I would, I've, I'm, I'm on record consistently saying that a budget is only as good as the numbers in the budget. You know, and, and if it's if it's if it's uh, if it's not a good budget, quite frankly, it doesn't matter if it's a one year, two year, or three year budget. And and I would highlight that the health service have the same uh, inflationary pressures as all other organisations and families in Northern Ireland. In fact, on top of those inflationary up uh, pressures, we also have what's called demographic pressures. And and as our and what does this mean for us? As our population ages. We need more than inflation to be able to meet the needs of those uh, of those members of our population. Uh, basically, if the if the budget is neutral in terms of inflation only, it means we can't offer increases to increase existing packages of care. For example, it impacts on our ability to address need of you know an 85 year old person. It's been established. It consumes over 11 times the health and social care resources of a of a younger person. 
And that really means as, as we have more 85 year olds in our population, we need more of a budget to meet the needs or the needs aren't met. And there's all sorts of constraints then in the system. So really, I would plea to, to, the, to the government, I would plea to the national government to recognize we're coming out of a pandemic. Yes, there's massive backlogs in our system, so which need resources as well in terms of our waiting lists, in terms of all our services. So please give us the resources we need to deliver our services. But obviously, the budget is out for consultation, so we can't get into too much detail in that, Chair. Okay, thank you. Uh, does anyone else wish to comment in relation to that? Kathy, did I see an indication from you at the start? Just to echo everything Neil said, I mean, you know, we're in a dynamic um, situation. Even keep the lights on in our hospitals and in our community settings is costing more now. I mean, we are living in a society that the cost is rising. Um, and, on, you know, it's more than just keeping up with inflation. But Neil is absolutely right. We will... We we will play our part and we will make sure whatever budget we get, we will use it wisely for those most in need. But as he says, you know, a more budget to meet the needs or the needs are not. That's a big message and we need to be very open and honest about it. Okay, um, thank you. Go ahead, go ahead, Jennifer. Yeah, I mean, it's the, it's the shift to multi-year budgets. It's also requiring more of a shift from... Uh, a, a fairly large proportion of non-recurrent revenue to recurrent revenue and it's also about the capital development we need. We talked earlier on about some of the infrastructure and the huge capital challenges that we have across our estate. All of that needs to come together. That in turn allows us to get the, the, the right um, size of facilities, the right staffing resource. That decreases reliance on the private sector as well. So all of those things together build up what we need um, with, within our health and social care service to, to allow us to be able to deliver the services that we need to our population. I think the only final thing I would add, we've talked a lot about workforce this morning and non recurrent funding has a real impact for us in being able to actually recruit to the workforce that we need to deliver the service. Because without the guarantee of recurrent funding, we find ourselves in a position where we can manipulate to some extent some posts at risk but across the system, it becomes increasingly difficult to actually recruit into posts on a basis whereby particularly when there are significant levels of vacancies across some professions and therefore individuals are in the position where they can pick and choose which posts they take. It presents us with a challenge when we don't have recurrent funding to be able to recruit to those posts recurrently. And that similarly then impacts on levels of agency spend. So there's an interrelation between the two. Thank you. And Melanie, I can't see you on screen, so I just want to check if you want to make a comment on that. No, I was just going to make the connection which Nikki has just made about that all ties up in greater uh, dependency on agency uh, and locum and that's a lot of our cost expenditure that we could avoid. So the better we can get uh, effective budgets that allow us to recruit and retain staff with the right pay at the right level and have the workforce that's fit for purpose, all of those different agenda items that, that my colleagues have um, mentioned would be improved. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, and I, ha I have to say, you know, Alan, do you have any other questions? I want to make a wee comment on that one, but I'll check, Alan, if you have any other questions in relation no, to that. No, I'm, I'm, I'm thank you, Chair. Yeah, and I think, I think um, generally speaking, there is a concern that's been expressed in the meeting around the urgency of workforce planning and the, the real need to move from kind of recounting the difficulties into an actual plan. I, I also am I'm a bit concerned. I had a question in with the minister, and this has just come back actually to me. I haven't even got a look at it in detail, but it refers to it refers to a effective workforce plan, a key theme of the workforce strategy, with the aim of developing and by twenty twenty six sustainably funding an optimum workforce. Now that to me is extremely worrying that we are still looking at at that sort of time scale here. Um, and we still don't see a detailed plan now as to where the starting point is, what the numbers are. So I think that is something that we really need to see um, some detail around this plan. And, um, and it's been going on for quite a long time and it's been identified as an issue. So I think that's something that you clearly all need to see prioritised as well. I know that's out with your, your direct control, but it's you who are kind of um, trying to manage services 
based on uh, dealing with vacancies and as Neil referred to, the demographic pressures which continue to increase the levels of service needed. So I think that's something we're going to have to really, really focus on um, in the time ahead. And, and there is some worrying messages. Um, Kathy, I just want to check, do you want to make any closing remarks there? Just to come back to you, if, if you have any closing remarks before I can, uh, before I let the, you, you all get back to your very busy roads? No, apart from just thanking um, the committee for the opportunity to talk openly about our challenges that we, we face. As you know, these are easy, there's no easy solutions, but you have um, our, our commitment and that our, our staff who have already been through and that they go the my time and time again and we'd like to thank all of the staff right across health and social care for actually their valiant um, efforts over the last two years and I do think we're beginning to see the beginning of the end rather than the end of the beginning and um, the excellent vaccination program but I mean half off to every member of the health and social care system um, that have actually worked directly over the last two years so th yeah. thank you for your time yeah. Yeah, thank, thank you, Kathy. And listen, on behalf of the committee, I want to thank you and all of all of your, your teams there and each and every one of your frontline staff as well. We do fully recognise the, the extreme complex challenges and how long these challenges have been going on. I mean, the last thing the Health and Social Care Service needed here uh, two years ago was a pandemic. It was already in, in extreme difficulty. And the levels of effort that your, your staff and yourselves have gone to to meet that demand have been probably superhuman, I would, I would say, at, at times. I do know, I do know that this has taken an awful lot out of staff and out of, out of leadership, and, and we, need to, we need to find a way to recognise that, to provide that, that, that rest, to get staff back to where they, where they are comfortable and where they belong and where they see themselves, and to get the services up and running. And then we have the mountain to climb of the waiting lists and the workforce, the workforce reviews. So certainly many challenges. I welcome the fact that, that the executive have agreed to uh, prioritise health in order to deal with some of these issues. However, that is now complicated by, by the vista of delay or uncertainty around budget, and that, that's, a, that's a further problem which does need to be addressed. But I want to thank you all for coming today, for addressing committee's uh, questions, and for committing to send us on some further information. So. Uh, Thank you, thank you for that, and uh, I want to wish each and every, every one of you individually all the best, and please take care and stay safe from the time ahead. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Chair. Thank you. Right. thank you, Chair. All the best. Okay, members. Um, okay, members, I'm going to suggest that we take a, a, a short break there just before we go into our next session, so could we come back at 11.30 and we'll resume then, members? Thank you.
Hey, Clerk, uh, just checking, can you see and hear me okay? Yes, Chair, I can see and hear you, Grant. And we do have everyone on the line for our next session? We do indeed, yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you, members, and uh, we'll now resume with our next item on our agenda, members, which is item six, Hospital Parking Charges Bill, evidence session today from the bill sponsor, Ashleen. Uh, members, we will continue with our scrutiny of the Hospital Parking Charges Bill with a response from the bill centre, the bill sponsor, to the evidence we have already heard. I refer members to the clerk's memo at tab 6.1 of the pack and to copies of the bill and the explanatory financial memorandum at tab 6.2 and 6.3. So I'd now like to welcome to our meeting Ashley Riley, who is MLA and the sponsor of this bill. Ashley, can you hear us okay? Yeah, I can hear you well. Yep, we're hearing and seeing you there, Ashling. Fine. And we're also joined by Catherine Kelly, who is Sinn Féin Party Support Officer. Catherine, are you able to hear us okay? Yes, thank you, Chair. Yeah, and we're hearing you, Catherine. Thank you. Okay, Ashling, I'll go back to yourself just and see if you would like to go ahead with your briefing, and we can then go to members for any questions that they may have. Thank you. Yeah, I'm going to be able to go to Kelly. I'm going to be able to my boy has a goal of us in Curry. Uh, the chapters were going new. Thank you very much for the invitation to come in front of the committee this morning. Um, I'm going to keep my remarks extremely brief and then open it for questions if, if that's okay. Um, Carly. So first of all, just good morning, and I want to start by thanking all the members um, for your scrutiny of of this private members' bill and abolishing hospital car parking charges up until this point. Um, I also want to thank everyone who came to committee and gave evidence on the bill, whether that be oral or written. Um, some of the, um, the information we I already knew in terms of the struggles and the pressures of workers and patients, um, but I think we can all agree that that was reaffirmed in those sessions. The bill, as you know, um, members, is extremely short with three clauses, and it, its, its objectives are to abolish hospital car park and charges for workers, patients and their families. I have been listening intently on your evidence sessions over the past number of weeks where we have heard again and again that hospital car parking charges are an unfair additional tax on everyone. These charges pose a real barrier and even more so now in a cost of living crisis and an energy uh, and a rise in energy crisis that will rise even further. Um, can I also thank the department who gave evidence? Um, I think it was the start of this week or the end of last week. Um, and just to let members know that I have met with them this week to discuss their, pro their proposed amendment from the Minister. Uh, I welcome the, that the Minister is supportive of the intent of the bill and his willingness to investigate the optimal way to deliver the bill's stated outcome. I reiterated to the Department that I am focused on making sure that the bill becomes law by the end of this mandate. And look, we, we've heard via the evidence sessions how positively abolishing hospital car parking will impact on people and ease any financial burdens that they shouldn't have to face as a result of hospital car parking. I also just want to put on record that I reiterated to the department that I will work with them and consider their amendment proposal subject to seeing it firstly, and we will keep an open door and conversation over the coming days and weeks. I've also spoken, I've also asked the department to discuss and look at the possibility of ways to reduce the burden on workers in the interim period, similar to what was done, the to what was done during the pandemic. So, Chair, that, that's my brief remarks. Um, if, if that's okay, I'll open for questions. I'm happy to take any questions. Go ahead, Mike. Yep, thank you. Um, so, in relation to the uh, to your engagement with the department um, and and that review, is it is it is it your position or thought at the minute that that is something that you'd be able to work with them on, and there is potential for that for that to be a kind of worked through with yourselves and the department. Um, that that's that that's something that you don't see as 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 problematic in terms of of getting the the bill out. Yeah, look, look, listen, I'm very supportive of the review. Um, I think the last review was done in 2012, and we all agree, and the department has agreed that a 10 year period between reviews is far far too long. Um, some of the, some of the things that were mentioned in the review, you know, we of course we are supportive of, um, and I think as you stated in the in the last evidence session, chair, that we're not reinventing the wheel here. Um, this has been done in other jurisdictions, and I think one of the key parts of this is the link between Scotland and Wales. That's going to be um, some key interaction that, that that the department will have to go and and seek from from colleagues in, in other jurisdictions. Um, 
and see what the best practice is elsewhere. Um, you know, in terms of Scotland, the way that they, they have done it, they've abolished the hospital car parking charges. So we need to learn from them and adapt and see what works and what potentially doesn't work. And, and I think that's going to be a key part in, in that review. Um, you know, we say all the time when we come up, we, we want to make good legislation and good legislation that works and that works for everybody. So, of, of course, uh, that, that review and the review that they have, have said that they want the undercarry is, you know, again, is very welcome. And um, they've talked about other points in terms of climate um climate change and that their commitments to that and of course we want to encourage people to make sustain uh, to, to go to work sustainably we, we want to encourage people to walk and 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 you know cycle if, if they are able to do so absolutely um they also talk about um how some of the the money that the revenue generated from car parking goes towards park and ride but we all agree that that the park and ride system just isn't fit for purpose um i've spoken to people to to staff who have said you know it's it's really a nine to five service and that's no use for anybody who's work, working eight to eight or you know eight to eight and coming out in the evening or, or in the morning so that service really isn't fit, fit for purpose so absolutely an overhaul and having a look into that into that park and ride system would be is very welcome um and of course the public transport infrastructure again just isn't isn't fit for purpose you know it, it doesn't help anybody from rural from rural areas that need to make it into the cities um I, I had a quick look yesterday just on some of the pricing of, of public transport and a single train ticket is £8, so it's £16 return. And if you're going back and forward to the hospital five times, you know, whether that be a worker or a patient, you know, that's just not sustainable. Um, so, of course, the review will 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 get those stakeholders around the table and, and discuss all those. And that uh, that is very welcome. Um, so, yeah, absolutely, you know, supportive of the review and the intent of what the department are looking to do. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'm going to go then to members. I have some members indicating at this point. So I'm going first to Paula Bradshaw, then Deborah Erskine, and then Jerry Carroll. And that's who I have at present. So Paula, go ahead, please. And um, thank you, Chair. I suppose my question is in relation to the minister's proposed amendment, and um, I'm just wondering, did you get an indication of timescales for that? I, I do think that the um, what, what they're proposing in the review is really, really welcome, and I think it would address a lot of my concerns about your bill and the whole um, premise of, of charging for car parking. But it's just really, my concern would be if we were to support the members, sorry, the minister's amendment, that it might be like so many of these workforce reviews that start and take years and years to complete. So I was just wondering, if, you know, how committed do you think they are um, to deliver on it? Um, thanks, Paula. Um, that is one of our concerns as well. Um, that there is no stated time frame. So, and and when we spoke with the department this week, that is one of the, the areas that we really want to we re really want to discuss and engage upon. Um, so when we go, but we have there, they have. I think when when the the department was in last week, again there was no answer to a time frame, and that is something that I very much want to see and have an indication of a time frame. So at the minute that discussion is ongoing. I will be going back and forward with the department in the coming days, um, but we would absolutely want to see a start point and, a, and an end point to to the review because, as you said, um, having these reviews drag on for a long period of time just wouldn't be it wouldn't be favourable for me. Okay, um, thank you, Chair. I, I suppose I suppose the second question was in relation to any indication you got for them them around. That suggestion, I think, was from the um, one of the trade unions around. You know that the hospital letter could have like a code for parking. So you know, it's just it's a it, it's a bit of a hybrid model of what you, what you're proposing. I wonder, did did you get any feedback from them in terms of that? Again, there was no direct feedback in terms of of specifics, but I think um, they are when they go away and do the review that they will be looking at all possible models. So I think again, referring back to Scotland and Wales and how they they worked their system and um, because there was you know there was talk of the automated number plate there was talk of, of codes on the letters that go out so those are all the things that that will be included in the review I, I i hope that there was no exact indication but those are those are the finer details that i would like to to discuss with the department um but i suppose when we i think we've the the committee have written off to to other jurisdictions and we're, we're finding it quite hard so i think i think that will be a key piece of the jigsaw um paula to, to be perfectly honest and how other jurisdictions are rolling it out um and, and what we can do what we can do here okay thank you thank you 
Thank you, Paula. And going then to Deborah. Go ahead, Deborah, please. Hello, Ashleen. Hello, Catherine. Um, it's it's good to have you at the committee, um, today to talk about this. I think that the, there's nobody in this committee that wouldn't agree with the intention of of this bill, um, you know, and and it is important that we we take a look at it, um. I'm just wondering, you know, in terms of what we've heard back, particularly, say, from trusts or, you know, the department and things like that is, you know, how do we square that circle in terms of the shortfall um, of, you know, the, the money and the, the budget aspect of things, you know? So how would you envisage, you know, trust being able to maintain the free parking facilities if they're unable to allocate money from other budget streams um, to the cost of maintenance? And we, we do welcome that they are going to ha have a review as part of the amendment. But I'm just wondering, have you had any discussions with the department in relation to that as well, Ashling? Thank you, Deborah. We again, we we haven't had those finer um, discussions in terms of the nitty gritty parts of the work where the funding and, and stuff would come from. But I think it was mentioned previously that there's tens, there's hundreds of millions of pounds going to, um, you know, agency staff. There's hundreds of millions of pounds that go into that. And so 8.8 .8 million, I think that the department had mentioned last week would be just a, a drop in the ocean in terms of that. But, you know, I think whenever the the Department of Health has allocated the budget, that this needs to be you know seriously considered because it is you've got the knock on effect in terms of you know retention and um, it's it's really hitting people hard in the pockets. And I know I know the Department of Health have budget budget constraints, but you know so do people and so do workers. They really do have budget constraints as well. So, but we haven't discussed the, the finer details of that, Deborah. If, if I'm being perfectly honest with you, um, in terms of where the money will come from, but I would hope that you know with the tens of millions that go in there you know with, with, with agency staff that we could maybe allocate some to to the, the the car parking and that will in turn then have a knock-on effect in, in the retention of the staff that we already have in in the health and social care trust okay thank you for that and and uh, just on another question i mean obviously the the car park in say the swa and the infrastructure around that is going to be very different to say the matter hospital or you know the ulster hospital for example mm -hmm. have you looked at you know what a bespoke or a sector or say a site pacific approach um not provide more added value um, again perfectly honest Deborah. no we haven't um Again, you know, different hospitals and different infrastructure will have different, um, you know, different kind of areas that they, they will need to work within. Um, I think having the review and having a complete review within all the five trusts will be really, really beneficial. Um, but yes, there are different trusts that have different, you know, different niches and, and that will need to be taken into consideration. And again, under the review with the department, you know, I'm willing to, to to, to work and have that conversation with the department. But I suppose that that's one of the points and I, I, I'll jot that down and we can definitely take that back and discuss that, Deborah, thank you. Perfect, thank you. And just final question. Um, do, you know, I think we touched on it there just in relation to obviously where, you know, the importance of, of climate change and, and how it's important that, that we're making sure um, that we're reducing our emissions and, you know, and, and encouraging more sustainable modes of travel. Um, in terms of that, I'd be interested to see, you know, have you had any discussions with, say, for example, I know it would be outside of, you know, the Department of Health, but even, you know, DFI in terms of encouraging um, that, you know, if the free car parking came into to play, um, also, you know, does it fit with, um, you know, ending car parking charges? Will that really help the environment or encourage sustainable travel? Um, again, thanks, Deborah. To be perfectly honest, where I'm coming from is if, if this if this was introduced tomorrow, mm -hmm. I don't think it's going to encourage anybody outside of the people to go to hospitals who already need to go to the hospitals. Um, but you're right in terms of, of the review, and, and I'll keep pulling back the review because that was one of the things that I had mentioned to the department in terms of, you know, the climate and sustainability. Um, and that would be, we absolutely want to encourage, and, and I'll say that I've said this before, and I'll say it again, we absolutely want to encourage people 
to seek alternatives if they are able to and if they are they are fit and able to. Um, and the department have said that one of the stakeholders that will be coming around the table will be DFI to look at how they can all work together and put and put systems in place that will really benefit everybody and encourage people to use public transport where possible. Um, and I think, you know, again, when I refer back to just having a quick look at the prices of some, you know, maybe ha having a, a reduction in some pricing and that the infrastructure, the travel, the public transport infrastructure at the minute just isn't, you know, suitable for everybody. But the department did indicate that DFI and other departments would be one of the, the stakeholders that they would get around the around the table to, to to talk that out. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you, Deborah. And going into Jerry, Carol, Lana Ray, let's the cash team, Jerry. The thanks, Chair. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Aisling. Uh, just a couple of points. Sorry if you said at the start, I just missed your opening comments, Aisling. Um, but I think the review kind of shows the department and minister are under pressure with this um, uh, issue, and you know, for PDE and, and the bill for for bringing it. Um, but have you indicated whether you are going to support the the amendment for the minister, or are you still considering it, or what's the the view on on the amendment? Thanks, Jagger. I mean, why to, we we haven't seen what the amendment looks like, um. So until we see what the amendment looks like, um, that will kind of determine, um you know what, what what our position will be i think um the minister has signaled his int he's he's favorable for the bill he has signaled that he is supportive of the intentions of the bill and i think having the conversation and looking at at action in this review is 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 really really positive and um, you know i said before it's it was 2012 since the last review um was done so a 10 year gap is just is just i think everybody is we're, we're all of the same opinion it's far far too long especially when it comes to when it comes to something like this and, and, and parking for for staff and for patients um but I, I think it's really positive that the department and the minister has signaled that you know that they welcome the intentions of the bill and that, that they're willing to work work with us um, but jerry to be perfectly honest we, we haven't seen what the amendment will look like so once we see what that amendment will look like then we will be able to take a position on that yeah, no problem. I uh, appreciate that. Uh, my intention will probably, uh, for the record, will be probably to oppose it. But again, I'll see the detail like yourself. Uh, just two other quick points. Um, so was the argument that came up um, from all the trusts, I think, uh, from memory, uh, was that, and you touched upon it there with Deborah, this idea that people will willingly kind of park in, in hospitals kind of just for the crack because uh, there's no cost. I mean, you're obviously in the same consistency as myself and the Royal being the, the biggest hospital. I mean, Anecdotally, and uh, I have no evidence, and I think if you have no evidence that people uh, go and park in the Royal for the crack uh, to go and work, who knows where, in the city centre or elsewhere. So just to kind of confirm, that, would that be your uh, experience, actually? 100%, Jerry. We have no evidence to suggest that people, as you say, go and park in the hospital for the crack. Um, I, as I said, if this, if this bill came into effect tomorrow, I don't foresee anybody outside of the people who need to go to the hospital will be going to the hospital. Um, I don't foresee anybody parking to, to make use of free parking. Um, I just there's no evidence of it, and I, I just I, I would be of the same opinion as yourself, Jerry. Thanks, and I think the, the, the trust actually said there was no evidence themselves from, from their uh, presentation. And then just finally, I mean, even obviously rural. I'm a, a like yourself, an urban uh, MLA, and, and rural. Um, people going to hospitals find it difficult for, for public transport but even in an urban area like sort of the west of the city you'll know there's there's obstacles you know if you're living in uh, mount eagles or parts yeah. of the murray or elsewhere you know trying to get into work uh, for nine o'clock if you're trying to use public transport you know there are obstacles there are, you know people who are unable to walk and having to walk long distances as well so i mean obviously people who can are able to should be using public transport uh, but it's obviously not suitable as you said i'd say those nine to five uh, or so uh, you don't have to answer that there, but that's just a comment from from myself. Thank you. Yeah, no, look, Jerry, you, you're, again, you're 100 percent right. There's uh, we ha we have to encourage people who are able and and who can to use public trans to use public transport. You know, if you can walk and if you can cycle, absolutely use more sustainable methods to get to wherever you need to go, whether that be the hospital or anywhere, any 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 work or anywhere, wherever you need to go. So, no, 100 percent would agree with you there. But there is. For for people in in the likes of Mount Eagles and even further afield, like we've spoken to, I I I spoken to a family in Fermanagh that had to come to Belfast. You know, there just is no train, there is no bus, there is no sustainable way for them to, to make that journey on a daily basis. So a car is the only option. Um. So for people who 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 
their only option is to have a card. You know, we, you know, we, we, we can't penalise them. We can't have an offer tax. We can't take it, take the money out of their pockets. And um, so hopefully with, with this bill, um, when it's passed, it, it will put that money back into people's pockets. Yep. Good work. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Jerry. And I can certainly concur as a rural rep. If we had public transport here, we would absolutely use it. And actually, it's 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 an inequity in the sense that we not only have to have a car, but families have to have multiple cars because one person goes off to their job, that's that car in the picture. So it, the, the the lack of of infrastructure around public transport in rural areas is absolutely um harmful to all of these all of these ambitions and aims i just want to bring in catherine there i think catherine had been looking in at a slightly earlier point but i'll, I'll check that with you catherine go ahead were you looking in there yeah uh thanks chair and uh thanks to the committee uh, just to say that the intention of the bill still stands uh Ashleen and i and and the party uh very much uh believe that this is an unfair additional tax on workers and is posing um, quite a significant inequality to people from rural communities. We are very open to working with the department to get this bill right because it's a very, very important bill. And we are determined to get it through uh, in this mandate, um, hopefully with an acceptable um, amendment from the department. Uh, we are open to discussion on a time-limited review uh, to address Paula's uh, question earlier and uh, the time uh, we would like it to be as little as possible. We want to get this bill right as I've said. Uh, the department has signalled in our discussions with them their intention to work with the Department of Infrastructure and uh, to work with their colleagues in uh, Scotland and Wales uh, uh, to see how they have made uh, this bill work. Uh, but just to say, you know, that our intention with the bill uh, still stands, uh, Jerry, uh, which is to deal with those inequalities that we have all identified and to take care of patients and workers' needs. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. And I'm going then to Pam Cameron, uh, our Deputy Chair, Pam Cameron. That's the last indication I have at this point. So, Pam, go ahead, please. Thank you. Sorry, Chair, I just had, just to, had to just get a, a switch on before I ran out of battery there. Um, thank okay. you, Ashley, for your uh, time today on what's a really important um, subject. Um, and I think it's something that we all want to see. We're all very aware of the postcode lottery that we have across what, you know, let's face it, it's a tiny place, which is Northern Ireland. And um, we'd really like to see that policy around the park and being fair and equal across the province. I'd also like to see maybe uh, more in terms of uh, the evidence and the outworking of, of what they've done it in Scotland and, and uh, perhaps the committee could request that we do um, uh, an evidence session on that. Um, obviously there are very particular challenges uh, in terms of the outworkings of this uh, bill, Ashleen, and uh, certainly in Belfast there's particular problems around capacity. Um, I do welcome, of course, the, the amendment um, that is proposed to review the whole scenario by the department. That is good news. Um, but I suppose in terms of asking questions to you, Ashton, could you, what about patients who have large medical equipment and may need to get full and proper access to parking spaces, uh, people who may not be fit or able to use public transport? Is there anything bespoke for them? so that there isn't um, a free-for-all over the spaces at hospitals, because it's important that those who really need close access to premises actually do get that access. Um, just speaking with the, with the department there during the week, um, they did signal that, you know, similar processes are in place in the other jurisdictions. Now, they don't know the details of them, but that would be something, and again, you've referenced it, and we've all referenced, referenced it, that we really would love to get in touch with those other jurisdictions to see how they cope and how they manage with those um, you know, those those things with, with patients who have bigger medical equipment and do need to get as close to the hospital as possible. So, you know, th those are, are some of the things that we would be really, you know, wanting to work with the department and trying to iron out those, those, those particular things because you know, we, we don't want to put any barriers in place. We do want to make legislation that is, that is you know, workable for people. We don't want to make lives harder for people. And um, so, you know, speaking with, with, with other jurisdictions, I think will be really, really key to this and how they cope 
and how they 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 have their their um how they work around this type of stuff and what the needs of the patients are because obviously the needs of the patients uh, would, would be high on the priority list um and and how they get as close to the hospital but i think the key piece here would be um to, to speak with those other jurisdictions and see how they how they how they roll out their their systems okay thank you Ashin, did did you consider placing a statutory requirement on the department to bring forward a, a uniform policy that all trusts should abide by? Um, that isn't a specific thing that we have brought to the department. But again, you know, I'm happy to jot that down and bring that to them, Pam. Um, to, so I, I will absolutely do that. I am due to meet them, I think, again, the end of this week or the beginning of next week. So that's certainly something that, that we will raise. Um, but again, the review, the review that they they are looking to, to the amendment that they are looking to put into this bill will, will undertake a, a full review of all the five trusts. I, I do know that. OK, thank you. And finally, for me, um, Ashley, I mean, I, I'm on record many, many times in the committee talking about how where we are in the mandate, how close we are to the end and um, the duty on us to properly scrutinise all legislation, and uh, I've ever seen every sympathy for you as a as also a proposer of a private members bill, um, which I'm hoping to get through. Um, but I think it is really important that we do take proper time to scrutinise and ensure that there are no you know unintended consequences from rushed legislation. Um, so it was just to put that on record. I do think we need to to hear more, um, and so that we can ensure that we don't have unintended consequences that, that wouldn't be good for service users in particular. Um, but just to thank you really for, for your time in this. But I suppose finally for you, um, you know, is this maybe a little bit premature, this bill, given now that the, the department are talking about reviewing um, the car parking issue anyway? W would this possibly be, would it be appropriate to have the review before we would actually go ahead with this type of legislation? Um, I, th I think, um, I actually don't think the review would have come about had it not been for this piece of legislation coming forward. Um, as I said, the last review that was done was in 2012, and it's taken almost 10 years for the next review to be looked at. Um, you know, as I said, what, what is in, the, what is in the, the proposed amendment is the review, but it would be a time scale, and we are absolutely... You know whether that we, we I am absolutely working towards getting the legislation over in this mandate, um, and we'll absolutely work with the department in terms of the time frame of that review. As you said, we don't want to be rush, rushing legislation through. We want it to be good legislation. We want it to work for people. So in terms of the amendment, you know we do want to see a time frame, but we do want to see a time frame that is suitable and that works for people. But at the end of the day, the bill is you know. People are are hit heavy in the pockets here in terms of car parking charges, and we do, we we need to keep coming back to that. That people are forking out hundreds of pounds out of their wage on a monthly basis, and um, patients are having to pay you know up to five hundred pounds to go to hospitals every every day, sometimes multiple times, um for, for for treatment. So yes, while we do want to make legislation that works, we also have to keep bringing it back to the people who this will really affect and whose pockets this is really hitting because at the end of the day, that's the type of we want to make legislation that is good and that works, but we also want to make it that, you know, people will really see the benefit of it as well. Okay, okay. thanks, Ashley. So I just had one final thought, and that's around, have you had any discussions with uh, community transport sector uh, in terms of what um, they may have to contribute on this subject, you know, given appropriate funding, you know, they may well be able to help us in terms of looking after the uh, environment and actually easing that pressure on the on the whole parking issue. So have you had any conversations with uh, community transport? At the minute, uh, Pamela, we haven't. But again, under the review, that is, a, again, one of the one of the key stakeholders that the department have indicated that they are going to bring around the table to see how, you know, bringing this bill into effect will will work so that's one of the the talk about bringing the dfi and, and public transport and other key and other key stakeholders in around the table um you know one of the, the the main things was that park and ride system and how that will really work and be fit for purpose um so that's not someone who i've spoken to but again i will jot that down and that is something that i am open to but i know that the department are bringing those key stakeholders around around the table and that will be part of the review thank you um, yeah, I suppose, I suppose just um, 
from my own point of view, we, we have heard significant and we have done significant evidence sessions already on this bill. It's very clear there are inequities here and there are challenges and unfairnesses inherent within this. I do have to say I welcome the uh, the approach that the department are now taking to the bill in terms of working with yourself as the bill sponsor. And I think the fact that they have indicated that they're working with you on a review indicates that they and, and the minister has indicated has, has said directly that he indicates that the intent of the bill and is now looking at working with you around the mechanics and the individual pieces that would make up a good bill. I think that's welcome and good practice. And I think that is the basis on which we 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 absolutely should move forward. I mean the idea of of just putting in extra sessions just for, for for the sake of additional time, I think would badly let down all those people who are currently paying the £60 a week that we have heard from the Belfast Trust. The people who Macmillan have identified are not turning up for appointments. That's a serious concern. And the, 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 uh, the, the, uh, the issues that are facing staff in terms of costs around the, the uh, public transport that you've identified there, asking. So I think it's, I think it's, it's the bill is in, it's good practice to me that a bill sponsor and department are working closely together. That seems to be the case here. And I think that if the department are willing or prepared to provide an amendment that, that satisfies them, then I think it's certainly something that we should continue on with uh, at pace uh, to, to, to get to get this into place and into legislation to help people. Um, I'm going to go to Alan Chambers there. Alan, go ahead, please. Chairman, this is certainly this, this bill is it, it's well-intentioned. Uh, and it's certainly easy to support the, 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 the thinking uh, behind it, particularly in relation to uh, staff having to pay to park their car when they're, when they're at their place of work. Uh, so I certainly accept that. But I also agree with Pam's comments that you know we are coming towards the end of the mandate and everybody wants their legislation, both the, the, the departments and, and the private members. Bill, everybody wants their legislation pushed through uh, by the end of this mandate. Um, and there is this sort of rush uh, to get as much through as, as we can. And I'm sure we'll all, all of us will be working hard to, to get as much of that legislation through before the end of the mandate. But we, as Palmer said, we have to be careful that, uh, you know, in that rush that we don't perhaps allow little bits of bad legislation to slip through uh, just because we maybe haven't scrutinized things as closely as we could or should um, and also that we we haven't identified the unintended uh, consequences uh, in our rush to 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 get uh, legislation uh, on on the on the books but at the moment we have uh, i know that the Sponsor said the department is working closely with the sponsors of, of the bill, and uh, I would hope that you know that that would be reciprocated. That the sponsors of the bill equally will be working with the department and trying to identify and understand the problems that the that it may this legislation may initially uh, present for trusts and for the department. Now we talked about we have no detailed information whatsoever at the moment on, on how it works in, in other juris, jurisdictions. We've, we've heard sort of some talk about how it works, but we haven't really seen the detail of, of that. And that, that's really important. How does it work in other, uh, in other jurisdictions? Um, so in, in, in that spirit, the, the, the bill states that it will come into action, it'll, it'll, it'll come into legislation six months after receiving royal assent. And I'm wondering. I mentioned this at the at the last meeting. If 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 six months was felt to be a, a tight turnaround for the Department of Health or the Trust to to put, you know, that all the the, the, the logistics in the place that are required, would the sponsor uh, view favourably an amendment that that there would be a maybe a, a short extension on that six months from royal assent, maybe maybe nine months. Would uh, would give the, uh, the the trusts a better uh, opportunity, but considering that we are still in the midst of of, of a pandemic, um, that that would give them more time maybe to do that. So just wondering if the, if, if the sponsor would uh, sympathetically consider that. Uh, and um, the other thing is we, we talked there about uh, you know very firmly, and Jerry mentioned there absolutely no evidence we're told of any abuses uh, in the car parks at at the moment. Um, but we can't, we can't with any certainty say that there won't be 
any abuses under this new system. That, that, that time will, will tell that. You can't provide evidence to trust. Nobody can provide evidence uh, that there will or won't be abuses until we see it in operation. Uh, but we know what uh, human nature is, and uh, if there's a if, if there's a trick or a stroke to be pulled, there are people who will will, will willingly uh, pull the stroke. Um, so, is, is there anything within the bill, or should there be something in the bill, or, or does there need to be anything in the bill? Maybe there are other ways of dealing with this that the trusts would have some sort of redress against anybody who was found to be uh, abusing. Uh, the system, you know, would there be a, 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 a system where they could fine them or ban them from the cock or whatever and say, does that, would that need to be in the bill or do the trusts already maybe have that within their bylaws or whatever that, that, that they, they could deal with anybody that abused the, uh, the, the free car parking? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Alan. Um, yeah, go ahead, Ashley, or Catherine. Yeah, I just want to. Yeah, just let me, before Catherine comes in, just want to touch on a couple of things that Alan had said there. Um, yes, absolutely. Um, that, that working with the department is absolutely reciprocated. Um, and I, and I, you know, I have said to the department, it, it's an open, it's an open car door. It's an open door. You know, we want to go back and forward. Um, but we do want to, and when you mentioned there that, you know, we don't want to rush any legislation through and we don't want to push legis legislation through. And I don't feel that that is what we're doing here. I think that, you know, there has been evidence sessions and this this bill doesn't divide opinion. You know, everybody is of the same opinion that these these car parking charges are, you know, are an unfair for tax on workers and patients. And we know that. So th this bill doesn't debate opinion there. And. The fact that the department is and the minister is willing to, you know, understands that the intentions, what the intentions of the of the bill are, and, and you know what what we're we're trying to get out of the bill, you know, I think that that is really positive and welcome, and that he he understands that and that he's willing to work with me on that. Um, in terms of you mentioned there are other jurisdictions, we don't know how it works, and you're absolutely right, and that is why we're trying to get information from those other jurisdictions. But I think that it's important that. You know, although we have no, we don't know exactly how it works right now. It's important to, to know and to say that it that it, it is working in other places. You know, and that we we're not, as I said before, we're not reinventing the wheel here. It is being done in Scotland and Wales. It's now going through in England. Um, and those are much bigger cities and bigger <laughs> hospitals that, that than what we have here. So yes, I absolutely agree with you that we do need to get the information on how it's working there. But it's important to know that it is working. And it is working there, but we do. I, I agree with you there that Alan. We do need to get those those, those finer details. Um, in terms of the abuse of car parking, um, you know, we, we don't have any evidence of it. You know, that's not that. I, I I don't know anybody, and I don't foresee anybody who's going to go to the hospital and sit and have a cup of coffee and nip into town because car parking and at the minute car parking in the town is cheaper than some of the hospitals. You know, so. I, I don't foresee that anybody is going to park in the Royal and get a, and, and go, go, go in to, or anywhere or high people from Fermanagh, you know, travel to Belfast. I, I don't foresee that happening. And there's no evidence to suggest it does. And there's no evidence also to suggest that that happened whenever car parking was uh, scrapped briefly in the pandemic. There's no evidence to suggest that there was any abuse of car parking. And um, I don't Catherine, if you want to come in there. Yeah, um, hey, Alan. Hey, Alan. Yeah, yeah, briefly. Um, the content of the amendment is still under consideration and, um, and we're very open to working with the department. I mean, I think the objective, we all share the same objective, the department and the sponsor of the bill, in that we want to address the inequality and we want to address the unfair tax on our health and social care workers. I think we all share that objective. So the content uh, is still under consideration and we're very, very open to working with them. Uh, you ask about uh, uh, fines. Um, in my reading on this, I, now I'm not sure whether it's Scotland or Wales, I can't recall the exact detail, but there is a system of fines for abuse and um, the, the fines are quite high and they're used to offset um, the the cost of running the car parks. So, you know, there are very practical ways that are being used in other jurisdictions. And of course, the review that the, the department is proposing would uh, would investigate all of that. So I hope that answers your questions, Alan. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you
The, just on that, you know, we, I say we don't have any information about Hyatt Works in, in other areas. Um, and you tell me that there are fines uh, in other areas, but it would be interesting as well, not only to see how they physically uh, do they uh, apply the logistics, but it might be worth seeing what legislation they have in place um, to cover it so that if, if there was something that we have missed, like fines or, or whatever, that uh, we could incorporate that in, in, in the legislation, just to make the legislation that little bit stronger. and and. Please, please don't get me wrong. Uh, I've seen. Uh, 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 I'm not trying to score a point here, be facetious. But I want to say that I, I admire your your um, your faith in human nature that uh, people will not seek to abuse it because uh, yeah, you know that's not my experience of of uh, of, of society sometimes. But the I uh, asked the questioner about would you be sympathetic? I don't think you really answered it. Would you be sympathetic um, if if the department or the trust said, look? Um, give us nine months or, or whatever period uh, after Roy Edison, rather than the six months that's currently uh, in the draft legislation. Um, would, would you be amenable to that or would that be something that uh, you would find difficult to live with? No, uh, Alan, and yeah, sorry, I had that written down and it, it is something that I wanted to, to, to come back on. Um, the, the six month period, you know, within the scope of, of or sorry, within the review, um, we, I, I, we would be open to, you know, however long. Uh, the grey area at the minute is we don't know how long the, the review will take. If it will, so that we need that we need to iron that out first. But in terms of the six months, you know, that is, of course, I would be open to to chatting with the department and 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 that time frame. Um, so absolutely open to to working with the department in terms of 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 that that that, that length of time. Thank you. Thanks, okay. Alan. Thank you. Okay, and um, okay. So, um, I, I suppose I suppose it is a, it is important just to highlight again and to remind members that we have asked Rays to do a piece of work on the on the Scottish and Welsh models. We have also heard evidence from others around some of the solutions that they have used. Because again, this boils down to control and cost. And the question is, how do you control the parking in terms of the spaces? And who should do that? And how do you pay for it? And and what this bill, to me, seems is addressing the issue of of how you pay for it. The department are working on how you can look at uh, in, within that review on a site by site basis how you provide the controls because because you clearly do want to have some control over it. But the question is, uh, should that prevent you moving to address the issue of unfairness for staff paying for the cost of it? So I think I think that's useful. Um, I'll also just check with the clerk. Um, we are waiting for that briefing document to go back. We could possibly suggest an additional a uh, section that Rails could brief us on the Scottish and Welsh models. Um, I'll check with you in a minute on that, clerk. The other thing to say is, I suppose that in some ways, whether it gets through the mandate is out with of our, our control as a committee. Our job is to do our scrutiny, apply our evidence, and, and take the evidence as relevant. We have largely done that. If, if it's useful to have an additional session with Rays either on Tuesday or at next Thursday's meeting, then so be it. But I think there's a kind of a, an overall mood within the committee that we keep progressing it, allow the department and the bill sponsor to do their work. Members are quite at liberty when it goes back into the assembly to raise uh, their own amendments, to raise their, their concerns and to amend the bill. That's all part of the process. And whether it gets through the mandate would all depend on that. But I think as a committee, we have a target of reporting on this bill as a committee. We have taken significant evidence. We can do a bit more if necessary, but I would like to keep us on track if, if we can. That would be my thoughts on it. So, um, Ashley, do you have any further comments you want to make in relation to any of that? Oh, sorry, Ashley, before you before you come in, I just want to check with the clerk in terms of the raise, the, the research paper on Scotland and Wales. Clerk, could we arrange a briefing on that for a committee? Yeah, yeah, we certainly can, Chair. We can look at um, either next Tuesday or next Thursday, just depending when they get it completed. Okay. So, Ashley or Catherine, do you want to make any final remarks? I don't have any other members indicating at this point. No final no final remark from myself, other than just to thank the committee um, for the scrutiny up until this point. Um, and, and some of the points that you've raised today, you know, we will certainly take that back and, and we will have a conversation and, and you know, ha have a look at some of those points. Um, and I, I take I take your points on board. But listen, just to, to thank you all for the for the scrutiny over the, the past number of weeks. Um, so, Gurmila Mayagov. 
Okay, and like, likewise, Ka- uh, Ashley and Catherine, we, we would like to thank you for coming back and forward to committee, answering committee members' questions, uh, and wish you all the, the very best in the time ahead. But we can we can let you go there at that, and thank you for today. Gormila, thank Mayev. you. Thanks, Chair. Thank Thanks, Chair. Okay, members. So, are members content then that we that we 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 let let the clerk look at how we would uh, potentially um, facilitate that additional briefing? But we are now at the position, members, that that is the conclusion. Other than the other than the uh, the raised briefing, that's the conclusion. We're at the position now. We are starting to look at whether or not committee are wanting to put forward any amendments. I haven't picked up a sense of that, but but it's open to discussion. So we we uh, we may need to if there are amendments we may need to schedule an additional an additional session to discuss that but I want to get a sense from members are members um, broadly content that we bring our scrutiny to to a, a, a close and allow the bill sponsor to continue working with the department in relation to this I have an indication from Paula go ahead Paula um thank you chair um I, like i i, I do, do think that what the minister and the department have outlined in terms of the review is really robust and far-reaching and I, I, it's exactly what should have happened before um your party colleague had to bring this this forward so i, I would like a session to actually for us to actually scrutinize any further details coming from the department in relation to the wording of the amendment i think that would be really useful um because what we found with other bills recently is we have sort of working in the dark as to what else is going to come at us as a committee. So that, that would be my suggestion. Thank you. So I'll just I'll just check with the clerk if we're likely if we if, if we have any control over whether or not we see the, the committee, the, the department's amendment. If we don't, clerk, can we do further consideration when that amendment when the wording of that amendment becomes clear? Yes, Chair, thanks. Um as far as our reporting goes, we have to report by the 20th of February. Um, I can't give any guarantee that we would see a copy of the, the wording of the amendment by the department before that date, but certainly the committee would be able to consider the amendment after that and come to a view of whether it wishes to support um, the department's amendment or not. Um, so it, it doesn't prevent us from taking a view, but um, just to be mindful that the committee has to complete its report on the bill by the 20th of February. Okay, Paula, are you, are you content with that approach? Yeah, sure. And, and I just do want to emphasise that, you know, I think it's a really, really good um, suggestion in terms of what the amendment is, but my big concern is that it's not time bound. And, and I'm, <clears throat> so I'm sort of using this platform to send to the health um, departmental officials to say that, you know, I think I would be, we would be minded in the Alliance Party to support it if it was very robustly tied down for timescales. Thank you. Yeah, and I think I think the bill sponsor there has indicated that they would also be prepared to to support it on that basis, provided it was. So I think, and and I, I do get a sense that they are working quite uh, quite um, collaboratively on it at this point to try to to try to get it. So hopefully that would be the case. Any other thoughts, members, in relation to any other members um, wishing to suggest any amendments? No, I don't see anyone then. So, so clerk, can you can you come back to us then with uh, with with however we can provide that additional session um, in conjunction with Reyes, and we'll we'll see where where that best fits in. No problem. So, otherwise, then, um, is there anything else we need to do today, clerk, in terms of of uh, decisions? I don't see anything else here at the minute. Um, are we... No chair, no chair. We're okay to continue. Thank, thank you, members. So, members, we're, we're going to move on then to our next item, which is item seven, Adoption Children Bill. And this is a briefing today now from the Department of Health. So, if I can remind you, members, that last week we were briefed by the Bill Clerk and the Examiner of Statutory Rules on the Adoption Children Bill, and a number of issues were raised in relation to departmental amendments and in relation to the delegated powers in the Bill. The Committee, therefore, agreed to ask the, rep- the Department to respond to those issues at today's meeting. And we have largely agreed all of all of the other items, but it's in relation to those ones specifically. So I refer members to the papers of tab seven of your pack, including a copy of the department's amendments to the bill at tab seven point one of the pack, a copy of the examiner's report at tab seven point two, and copies of the bill and the EFM at seven point three and seven point four. 
I have also been advised that the department has led some additional amendments. These are tab 7.6 of the table pack, and I will ask officials to outline the intent behind those amendments. So I'd now like to welcome Elish McDaniel, who's Director of Family and Children's Policy. Can you hear us okay, Elish? I can, um, Good afternoon, yes. Yeah, and we're hearing you there fine, thank you. Also, Julie Stevenson, who works in the Adoption and Children Bill team. Can you hear us okay, Julie? Yes, I can, thank you. And Adele Willis, who works within the Adoption and Children Bill team. Can you hear us, Adele? hear you too, thank you. So I'm hearing all three of you clearly there, but I am picking up on some feedback, so I'm not sure if that's due with someone up and on mute. Um, it also is generally helpful if people have headsets, and um, that's usually helpful. Um, it's not it's not overly disruptive in this case, but there is a bit of a buzz on the line. So I wonder if you all could just mute there for a second to see if we can identify which line that is. Okay, it hasn't, it, hasn't, it hasn't made any difference so far, so I'll just ask all the members to check that they're on mute. But we'll go ahead with the session anyway. So um, what I will do is I'll go back to yourself, Eilish, and just check, is it you making the opening remarks and briefing or some of your team there today? Okay, sure. Yes, I'll start with some um, opening remarks and then um, Julie and um, Adele will, will come in and, uh, in response to any detailed um, technical questions that the, the, the committee um, may have. Um, so uh, just to say good, good afternoon um, again, and I would like to thank um, you, Chair, and committee members for another opportunity um, to provide um, some further brief briefing um, on the um, bill. My understanding is that this session is intended to focus specifically on two issues. Um, the first is the delegated powers in the bill and the use of negative or affirmative resolution procedure for particular regulations and the second um, is the departmental amendments to insert new clauses for 143A to 143E, um, which relate to the preservation of, of records and specifically um, the issue um, of scope. If I can start with the um, issue of delegated um, powers, and then the department is aware that the examiner of statutory rules in a report on the bill's delegated powers suggested that the committee may wish to consider whether the required level of assembly control should be altered from negative resolution to affirmative resolution in relation to certain regulations to be made under separate, sorry, seven separate clauses of the bill, clauses 24, 42, 52, 77, 130, 149 and 150. Starting with clause 42, the Minister has already advised the Committee of his intention following representations made by Jim Allister, MLA, during the second stage debate on the Bill to make such an amendment in respect of this clause, which provides a power for the Department to prescribe in regulations the matters to be taken into account by an adoption agency in determining or making any report in respect of the suitability of um, people to adopt a child. The Minister has now tabled an amendment to Clause 155.2 to include regulations made under Section 9. And by way of the amendment, regulations made under Section 42 will be included in the list of regulations which will be subject to affirmative resolution and procedure. And this will be consistent with the approach being taken with other similar regulations. We've considered the remaining, the remaining six clauses that the examiner has suggested should be altered to, to strengthen assembly control, and the minister has tabled amendments for consideration stage in relation to three of these. So clause 130 amends articles 35D and 45 of the children order to include provision, which enables the department by web regulations to impose time limits on the making of representations, including complaints about the discharge of an authority's functions under the children order. And that is representations by a looked after child and by other specified individuals in relation to a looked after child. Subject to public consultation, it's anticipated that the regulations would provide that a complainant must make representations within one year if the grounds for such representations arose. It also proposed that the regulations would allow an authority to consider representations made outside of the time limit if, they, uh, if there were justified reasons, and it's still possible to consider such representations effectively and fairly. Taking account of um, the concerns and moving to impose time limits on the making of representations, complaints, 
the Minister is content that the relevant regulations should be subject to affirmative resolution procedure to ensure full scrutiny by the Assembly, as the regulations would be made under Articles 35D1A and 45 4A of the Children Order. An amendment needs to be made to Article 183 of that order in order to provide that such regulations should be subject to affirmative resolution procedure. Council has drafted an amendment to Clause 130 and to provide for this, and the amendment has now been tabled for consideration stage. Clauses 149 and 150, if I can now deal um, with those. So Clause 149 provides for regulations to allow the search and inspection of the Northern Ireland Adoption and Children Act and Register, which I refer to as NIACAR by prospective adopters who are suitable to adopt a child to enable them to identify a child on the register for whom they might be appropriate adopters. Clause 150 provides for regulations relating to searches and inspections of the register and by um, adoption agencies. Other regulations relating to NACAR um, to be made under clauses 144, 146, 147 and 148 of the bill are to be made by affirmative resolution procedure given the nature of the information contained in the database. Having reviewed the position, the Minister considers that it would be appropriate for any regulations made under Clause 149 or 150 to also be subject to the same procedure, and this will ensure consistency of approach for all re regulations relating to NIACAR. Council has drafted an amendment to Clause 155 of the Bill to include in the list of regulations which are subject to affirmative resolution procedure in subsection 2, regulations made under these clauses. And the amendment has now been tabled for consideration stage. In relation to the remaining um, clauses 24, 52 and 77, the Minister has agreed that the regulations to be made under these clauses should remain subject to negative resolution procedure. And the Department doesn't therefore intend to table any amendment in relation to these. And I, I now try to um, briefly explain, or, or, or as briefly as I can, explain the reasons um, why this position is being taken. Clause 24 enables the making of regulations which are considered to be procedural in nature. And while they relate to refusing contact, they do not specify the grounds on which contact may be refused. Rather, it's intended that they would specify who must be informed when contact is refused. And this would include the child, prospective adopter, and any person for whom contact is made possible by way of a contact um, order through the courts. It's also intended that regulations would specify what needs to take place in advance of the decision to refuse contact. And this is intended to include the agreement of the child, prior consultation with a prospective adopter, and a written rather than a verbal um, agreement. So this is about putting some level of control around um, a refusal um, to, to um, permit contact, but they're all procedural um, arrangements. On, on the basis that these regulations are intended to specify process around a decision to refuse contact rather than the grounds in which contact might be refused, we consider that, that affirmative resolution procedure is not appropriate, nor is it necessary. Turning then to clause 52. This enables the department to make regulations applying with modifications or disapplying certain provisions of the children order in relation to a child who an adoption authority has placed or is authorised to place for um, adoption. Once an adoption agency has been authorised to place a child for adoption, that child becomes looked after and as a consequence the children order should apply. However, there are some adjustments required to take account of the fact that the requirements under the bill will also now apply as a child is to be placed um, for adoption. So you've got two competing sets of, of provisions um, applying um, simultaneously or potentially um, applying simultaneously. It's not appropriate to have a continuing duty to promote contact under the children order as contact will be agreed as part of the placement for adoption arrangements under the bill. Likewise, the requirement under the children order to seek the views of parents no longer needs to apply. This um, does not mean that the, their views won't be sought. Clause 3 of the bill requires the adoption agency in coming to any decision about a child's adoption 
to have regard to the wishes and feelings of any of the child's relatives. And finally, any requirements under the children order for the child's parents to make contributions to the child's maintenance will also be disapplied, which in the circumstances um, is um, right and proper. It's important to highlight the fact that the regulations to be made under clause 52 won't amend any provision um, in the children order. So it, the, it, the order will not be amended at all. Such provision will just not apply in this specific set of circumstances. The modifications will apply only for the purpose of ensuring that account is taken of the fact that the child has been placed or is being placed um, for adoption. That is a looked after child has been placed or is being placed for adoption. And as a consequence, the provisions of the bill rather um, rather than or in place of comparable provision under the children order will apply. We consider that this is a technical necessity to avoid the duplication of duties and any confusion that might arise as consequence. And as a result, we don't consider that the affirmative resolution procedure is required or necessary. And our approach is consistent um, with that taken in England and Wales in relation to similar regulations made under the Adoption and Children Act of 2002 to modify and disapply um, the Children Act of 1989 in exactly the same circumstances. Clause 77 creates a power to prescribe in regulations the information that must be provided to the Registrar General when seeking to obtain a certified copy of an entry in the Adopted Children Register relating to an adopted person who hasn't reached the age of 18. And these regulations will be made by the um, Department of Finance, which is policy responsibility um, in this area. It is anticipated that the information required to be provided would be full name and date of birth of the adopted person, the full names of the adoptive parents. And this is the minimum information required to support um, identification. These details are the same as those that current, as those currently prescribed in regulations which are required when an adopted person over the age of 18 is applying for their birth certificate, and when an adopted person under the age of 18 is applying for information about whether they and the person they intend to marry may be within prohibited degrees of relationship. The regulations prescribing this, um, the adopted person's birth records regulations, um, which were made in 1995, um, were made by way of negative resolution and procedure. We don't therefore consider that it would be appropriate for regulations to be made under um, Clause 77 of the Bill, which may actually be an amendment to the existing 1995 regulations to be subject to a different procedure um, to the original regulations. We also consider that um, as the matters that um, will be prescribed already apply in existing applications um, to the GRO, affirmative resolution procedure is not necessary. Chair, if I can now turn to the um, new clauses relating to the preservation of records and, and, and specifically the issue of scope. The clauses are intended to give effect to part one of recommendation four from the report of the Truth Recovery Design Panel, um, which was published on the 5th of October 2021. Um, that recommendation was accepted by the executive on the 4th of November 2021, members were advised of the executive's decision by way of a statement by the Deputy First Minister to the Assembly on the 15th of November 2021. The aim of the Truth Recovery Design Panel recommendation is to ensure that records relating to relevant historical institutions are preserved, that is safely maintained and not destroyed. These are the institutions which were examined by the panel and before that, um, were the subject of research by Queen's University and um, the Ulster University. They include mother and baby institutions and workhouses, places um, where women were placed as a result of pregnancy outside of marriage and then gave birth to children, many of whom were adopted and many more of whom were taken into care, either residential care or foster care. They also include Magdalen Laundries and um, places to which many women from other and baby institutions were then moved in the absence of anywhere else to go subsequent um, to giving birth. According to the QUBUU research, 
23% of children are recorded as having been adopted from mother and baby institutions and 38% moved into state care. 23% of those into state in the institutions and 15% into foster care. The records relating to these women held by the institutions in which they resided or by the agencies responsible for either placing them there or making arrangements for the adoption and care of their children hold the stories of many children's early lives. They mark the start of many children's adoption and or care journeys and hence the very strong connection um, with the Adoption and Children Bill. These are the records sought and used by adoption agencies to supplement their own records for the purpose of assisting with tracing and facilitating contact between adopted adults and their birth relatives um, where this is agreed and, and, and wanted. One of the reasons for preserving these records, and this is reflected in the definition of relevant document, is their potential relevance to a future investigation or inquiry. The executive has agreed that um, both records of historical significance, both to individuals and society more generally, and on that basis alone are worthy of preservation. The report of the research by QUB and UU um, pointed to the poor state of many of these records and the conditions in which they um, are being held. The Truth Recovery Design Panel also recommended the establishment of a permanent archive to which these records will be key. I've tried to explain the connection with the Adoption and Children Bill, allowing fully aware of the question that the question of scope is a matter for the speaker. The committee has asked what the department is planning in contingency terms and should it be decided that the preservation clauses are out of scope. Before the events of, of last week, the only resolution um, would have been a small discrete bill for this purpose, brought forward by accelerated passage subject to the approval of the executive and assembly. However, um, this is no longer um, an option. Unfortunately, if these clauses are deemed to fall out of scope um, by the Speaker, a new bill in the next mandate, potentially also brought forward by accelerated passage, um, would be the only way forward. Chair, I can end um, by making reference to um, the notice of amendment um, received by the Department yesterday, which sets out proposed amendments um, to the preservation um, clauses. Um, they're quite extensive. Um, we're currently giving them detailed consideration. But on initial analysis, and, and I do emphasise an initial um, analysis, um, which requires to be confirmed by Council, some of the amendments are not necessary, particularly in relation to Clause 143C. They seek a level of detail not normally included in primary legislation and, and are already covered by existing um, clauses. Some of the proposed omissions are also potentially problematic, but we're working our way through those um, with Council. And when our examination concludes, we will provide um, advice to the Minister in advance of consideration stage. Thank you, Chair. That, that's the end of my um, opening um, remarks. Julie, Adele and I are very happy to take any questions that members might have. Yeah. Okay, just just a couple of, uh, of small items. Uh, first of all, just in relation to scope, obviously that's not, that's not a call for the committee, it's more around that contingency that we, we wanted to ask you about. That that will remain a call for the speaker. In terms of the amendments, just to, just to, to declare the interest, those amendments are Sinn Féin amendments and not committee amendments. Um, I'm, I'm named on those as a Sinn Féin member, and they, they would, just for information, they, they, they seek to strengthen the bill, and they're very much based on feedback that we have received from, from the people and survivors and families who have been impacted. But anyway, those, those, those can be... I want to go back, Eilish, to the issue around the affirmative and negative, and I know you've addressed them in some detail on 24, 52 and 77. They are significant areas, I have to say, and I do have to say I didn't hear anything that to me convinced me overly that the concerns of the examiner have been addressed or, or are not relevant. Now, I'm, I'm open, the committee will discuss this, this following, but I suppose I'm struck by the fact that the examiner has not really indicated concerns of this of this type in relation to anything else or or much else in that sense. So I just I just think if it's a if it's a question of a bit of additional um, scrutiny in the future, given that the first one twenty four deals with who must be informed, um, and and I know you've described that as procedural, but it is a fairly a 
impactful piece of legislation around the, the issue of who doesn't get to have contact. That's, that's a big issue. I think that goes to the heart of the examiner's concerns. The other one in 52 of different playing parts of the children order, order is significantly substantial and, and, and a, quite, a big, quite a big step in any, in any uh, consideration. So again, that's something that, that, uh, that, that I think does need to be carefully considered and we will consider. And then um, 77 then equally is, is an important issue. So I'm just, uh, I'm, not, I'm not entirely convinced of the rationale for those, but it'll be, it'll be up to committee. But anyway, I want to go to committee members then. I'm going to go to Colin McGrath, please. Thank you, um, Chair, and thank you for the presentation. I think, um, Eilish, that was probably difficult to read. You can imagine how difficult it was to try and comprehend and understand all those clauses and sub-clauses that you were referring to. And a lot of the clauses that are in the amendments do jump back to previous clauses, which reference others, and it's very, very complicated to follow. Um, and it was just maybe in that vein I wanted to get, um, there was just two um, of the departmental clauses that I wanted to make reference to. One was about um, clause 143, which um, originally the department wanted to remove the annual report uh, reporting element, and then the committee had indicated that it was unhappy with this, and we had led uh, uh, an amendment which set out some reporting that would take place, and then I see that there's now a departmental amendment to that. I was just ask, I want to ask what your understanding was of the differences between what the department is now proposing to what the committee was proposing, because obviously these two clauses are going to sit in contention to each other whenever we get into the house. Okay, um, Colin, for, what, what the department was proposing originally was um, to remove um, the clause, um, and that obviously would have removed the requirement to um, report on a on, on an annual um, basis. And, and part of the reasoning um, for that was, um, despite the requirement that has been in place since the Children Order um, came into um, being, there's only ever been one annual report um, produced. Now, you could argue that that was wrong, and I, I, I absolutely um, accept um, that point. I think, I think the more substantial argument um, is that since the Children Order has come into um, being, there have been other reporting mechanisms um, put in place. Um, and uh, and they're quite comprehensive and and and, and signal and indicate um, the extent to which children order um, duties and obligations um, are being um, met by um, health and social care trusts and and others. So I think that's the more substantial um, argument. Um, I think then the the committee has indicated um, that it, it's not happy um, with that requirement um, to be um, removed. But I think what the department is proposing as an alternative is that we report maybe every three years in place of annually. Um, and um, the, the, the risk by an annual reporting cycle, um, Colin, is, is that um, you have no sooner got one report um, finished that you're starting to make preparations um, for, um, for, the, the, for the following report. So you could be in a, in a constant cycle um, of reporting. A three-year reporting cycle might actually um, be more um, appropriate if the committee is minded um, to um, keep the um, clause in place. Sorry, keep the provision um, in place. Just, just, Alice, just, just for an item of, just for an item of clarification, just to say that there's two separate reports at, at play here, and we need to just make sure and keep them separate. So there is that issue around the report of the children order, which we, which we didn't want to accept, but the department have now proposed an amendment, and we will discuss that an amendment of three-year reporting. The other one was that we had asked as a committee that a reporting mechanism would be put in for this bill. And I think that was to be three years, uh, there was intervals put in place. And I think the department have accepted that that, 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 is, that, is, that is something that they think it, that they are content to agree with, I think, Eilish, am I right in saying that? Uh, uh, absolutely, in terms of a duty um, to report an implementation um, under this bill, that the, the um, department is, is content um, to support that, there may be some technical issues um, with the um, with the amendment proposed by um, the committee. So I think what is being proposed is that the department, by way of regulations, um, 
uh, brings the duty um, to a halt um, after a minimum period of, of, of 10 years. What we're suggesting um, is that there might be a different way um, to do that by way of a sunset um, clause, um, for, for example, and, and that's, that's the only concern that we have about it um, at the minute. But in terms of the duty to report um, uh, within three years, and I think every five years there, thereafter, the department is absolutely supportive of that charge. Yeah. And we will, Colin, we will, Colin, go on to discuss our approach okay. to the department's suggestion around a, an amendment to that 143. We, we will discuss that as well before the opportunity to discuss that. So do you have any further questions, Colin? Yeah, just again, the references that were made to the um, affirmative uh, uh, and negative resolutions. I just wanted to seek some clarification because the proposal um, is an amendment, I think, to... Clause 155, which refers to Section 9 and to Sections 42, which is regarding the um, the uh, uh, checks on the suitability of those for adopting and the status of their relationships, and it makes um, it, it does make references to um, the, the checking for the stability of the relationship, um, and I was just wondering what mechanisms you would have envisage for checking the stability of people's relationships and whether in suggesting that it automatically suggests that there's two people in a relationship obviously so does does that have any unintended consequences on the ability for example for single people to be able to apply for adoptions um, or is that contained in other uh, regulations so the, I mean, there, 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 there are two things, um, Colin. The first of them um, is eligibility to apply to adopt, and then the second, um, the, the second thing is suitability and um, to adopt. The two different processes uh, mm -hmm. covered by separate provision um, within um, the bill. So, in terms of an, a, a single person's um, ability to apply and um, to adopt, that is that is already enshrined um, in legislation, and there's nothing under this bill. That actually um, changes um, that um, su suitability. Um, it, it will be a matter for um, social workers by way of a, a pretty robust and comprehensive um, assessment process um, to um, determine and, and, and it will consider um, where, where individuals are in a relationship, for example, the, the stability of that relationship. And I think any of us would accept that the stability of a relationship will be um, important to, to determine whether or not um, someone is um, suitable um, to um, adopt um, a child. So they, they are two different things, um, Colin, uh, and, uh, eligibility and, and, and suitability. Um, one, one is governed by, by, by the legislation um, and, and, and the other is, is a professional um, decision-making um, process um, based on a whole range of information. Could I, could I just add um, to that, if you had Clause 42 actually says, in relation to the reference to, the need to consider suitability in a relationship that it only applies in relation to a couple. Okay. So it, it, it is, it's not even it, it's not even a consideration where it's an application from a single individual. Okay. So sorry, again, just in terms of sometimes you see uh, an amendment, you don't get to see the full context of what it's in. And sometimes you get lost in the maze of the cross-referencing, but there's nothing there in that, that amendment that would disbar single people from applying for adoptions then? Okay. Absolutely not, Colin. Perfect. Okay. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, just check with the clerk. I don't see any other indications from members at present in relation to this session. No other. No um, other. Sure. Okay, well listen, thank you for coming along and for, for going through that with us. It is it is complex and it does maybe take a bit of time just to, to, to uh, thrash that all through as to the implications of all of that. Is there anything else you wanted to say, Alish, before we wrap the session up with yourselves and then the committee will go into a discussion on this? Uh, n nothing at this um, stage, Chair. Um, thank you again for the opportunity to further brief the committee. Okay, well, thank you, Eilish, uh, Julie and Adele for your, your uh, attendance here this afternoon and all the best to you all in the time ahead. Thank you for that. We can let you go ahead and we'll, we'll continue on our discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay, members, so I suppose there's two things occurred to me as a result of, of all of that, that that we maybe need to have a bit of a discussion on.
the, uh, the department's proposed amendment to clause 143 and that move to reporting on a three-year basis rather than annual. So we had we had said we were opposed to 143, which was doing away with all the reporting. The department have now come back with a proposal that they would amend to look at a three-year report. I actually think, I have to say, that has some merit. I can see where maybe a three-year report would be actually more valuable in some ways that you have a longer span. So to me, that's a welcome enough move, and I think one that would maybe provide the safeguard that we want. So the children order continues to get reported on. Um, so members' thoughts on that? Would would we be happy? Would members be generally content to support the department's proposal on this? So I'll, I'll ask Colin first to the raise of the see Pam indicating in Paula. So Colin. Uh, yeah, no, just I think that's sensible because three years gives you a bit of scope to be able to investigate. You know, an, an annual basis, sometimes you haven't got through enough cycles of things to be able to get learning, whereas across a three-year period, you know, that's a substantive examination period to be able to look and see what you've done and what you can improve. So I think to go from the suggested nothing to get them to three years, once every three years, I think is reasonable enough. Mm. Pam? Yeah, Chair, I think I'm minded to go the same way. I mean, you, what you don't want is them to be in a, a continual state of reporting as opposed to actually doing. Um, and we just know with so, so much red tape um, applies to so much of life and so we want to avoid that as much as possible and we want to see it work much better. So the three years is, I think, would be probably a good consideration at this point. Okay. Paula? Um, Chair, I wasn't indicating to speak. I was just indicating my um, support for the, this sort of compromise. Thank you. Thanks, Paula. Okay, members, so I think there's broad agreement there with that. Uh, I think there's broad agreement with the committee that we are content. Uh, so then can we agree, members, that we withdraw our opposition and we will con consent, uh, agree to the department's amendment? Are members content? Yeah, thank you. Okay, members. The other the issue then is in relation to the uh, the affirmative versus negative uh, resolution issues that have arisen and, and have been brought to our attention by the examiner for statutory rules. The department's amendments in relation to the issues raised. Uh, so the department had brought forward amendments to make changes to clause 42, 149 and 150, so their draft affirmative. However, they have not done so with clause 52, which was highlighted by the examiner of statutory rules as a significant concern. Um, so I'll take members' views. I suppose I didn't hear really a very clear rationale as to why it would be a really bad idea. It's not that big a change. Really, it just provides an additional layer of scrutiny and security. So I think given that the examiner has raised it and, and she doesn't clearly raise these things lightly, um, I think that's, that's relevant. The other ones that the examiner raised was 24, which is around who must be informed. And 77, which is around the power to who, who's who is the power to dictate full names and powers and all of that. So the examiner raised 24, 52, and 77, in addition to the ones the department have moved on. So what are members' thoughts in relation to whether we continue to seek that those be affirmative, which is, I think, the position we have already uh, arrived at, or whether we're... Uh, Consent, consent, content to look at them going back to negative as the department are, are indicating they think is is more appropriate. Colin, go ahead, please. Sure, I suppose it's it's. I, I'm not. I, I've been convinced by the examiner, and I haven't been convinced by the department. And I kind of generally, as a rule of thumb, think that the affirmative process is maybe more of an inconvenience to a department, um, whereas the negative. Uh, route is something that's more convenient because they bring in the rules and then come 30 days later, whereas uh, in an affirmative route, they have to actually make their case to the House and then it gets changed. So if I put that on a set of scales that the examiner is not happy, the department hasn't convinced us, and that the changes that we're suggesting would be more inconvenient to the department, I think I would be more inclined to stick with wanting those um, affirmative procedures unless the department can really come back and, and impress upon us that there's a reason not to do it. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of broadly there too, I have to say, and I think that's pretty well summed up in that sense. Um, you know, the, the, these are important issues. Like, these are really fundamentally important issues, and I think additional additional trouble is uh, and additional scrutiny are are indicated here so to make sure that there's, there's a good uh, scrutiny over it. Paula? 
Yeah, no, I I, I agree with yourself and, and um, Colin there, I have to say, but I some, you know, I, I think sometimes we don't know what we don't know about how things actually have to take place within the department. So the fact that they have gone back and looked at it and they're still are of this opinion or are of this opinion, then, you know, I would, I think we should consider it a wee bit more, I have to say. Just, uh, but as you say, you, if they want another opportunity to come back and convince us to, to go with their proposal, then I'm, I am open to, to listen to that thing. Um, Clark, in terms of timings and timeframes, what are we looking at here in relation to consideration of this of this issue? Well, Chair, just to say that um, first consideration stage, stage is next week, so we wouldn't be able to table any amendments in time for that. So these are amendments that we would consider at consider further consideration stage. But I think it's something that could be flagged up during the debate um, to maybe seek some reassurances or further explanation. Um, and what we can do is I can work with um, the Bill Clark on this to get some amendments drafted for consideration in, in a week or so um, that the committee following the debate next week can maybe have another discussion about. But um, certainly we can start the process for drafting amendments, um, which would then be tabled at consideration stage if the committee felt that way. Okay, would members be content to proceed on that basis? Yeah, members content. So can I just check with you, Clerk, that we have uh, we've 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 provided sufficient clarity there in relation to one four three. We're withdrawing our opposition and, and supporting the department's amendment. And um, in terms of this issue, we're going to uh, continue to keep this under scrutiny and draft amendments uh, in the event that we we want to proceed with amendments. Yeah. So we will draft amendments to twenty four fifty two and seventy seven. Yeah, um, that would move them to affirmative. Okay, thank you. Okay, members, any other thoughts or members want to raise in relation to that before I move on? No, thank you. Okay, members, so moving on then, I'm going to our first SL1, uh, which is item 8, and it's in relation to Family Practitioner Services Independent Appeals Regulations NA 2021. The Department advises that this proposed statutory rule will allow for an independent appeal panel to be established for Family Practitioner Services. The regulations will be made under the Health and Social Care Bill, which has now passed final stage and has been referred for royal assent. The department advises that there was an error in the original SL1 document and has provided the revised version. So I refer members to the revised SL1 at tab 8.1 of the pack and department officials are here to brief the committee on the provisions of these regulations. So without further ado, given time pressures, I will go to John Miller, Principal and Transformation Planning and Performance Group. John, can you hear us okay? I can, Chair, yes. Thank you. And Noreen Mahan, who's Deputy Principal in the Transformation Planning and Performance Group. Can you hear us okay, Noreen? I can, Chair, yes. Okay, so if uh, could I just check back with yourself, John, uh, which of you are dealing with the opening remarks and briefing, and then we'll go to members. Chair, hopefully uh, I'll deal with uh, most of your questions that you may have through a short brief, and uh, then Noreen and I are quite happy to answer any questions you have after that. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, John. First of all, Chair, thank you very much and the committee for the opportunity to provide this briefing in respect of the Family Practitioner Services Independent Appeals Regulations. I wish there was a shorter title. Um, I hope the information provided prior to today's session within the SL1 proved useful. To recap, the department proposes to make statutory rule under powers conferred on it by the Health and Social Care Northern Ireland Act 2022. This legislation having received royal assent on the 2nd of the 2nd 2022. I should point out that the powers being used for the statutory rule have not yet been commenced and that the department intends to bring the statutory rule, which is subject to negative resolution procedure, into operation as soon as the powers in the Act have commenced. The statutory rule will allow for an independent appeal panel to be established for family practitioner services covering GPs, dentists, community pharmacy and ophthalmic. It will also set out the associated operational procedures for the panel such as membership, um, voting rights, etc. This panel will deal with any, with any appeal or dispute of decisions made by the former Health and Social Care Board committees, which will sit within the department following the Health and Social Care Board's closure. The background to this is that the department following the anticipated closure of the Health and Social Care Board will be responsible for decisions previously made by the committees of the Health and Social Care Board. This appeal panel is required, therefore, to provide an avenue for appeals to an independent body 
against decisions that have been made by those committees that will now be part of the department. It is important that the new appeals process is, append, is independent and is seen to be independent and is sufficiently robust to withstand possible legal challenge. The structure of the, the appeal panels will be as follows. The panel will comprise at least three members, including the chair. Panels will comprise, other than the chair, both those with experience of the relevant professional discipline and lay members. An independent chair will be legally qualified and be in post for a fixed term. A panel member with relevant professional experience will be appointed following consultation with such organisations as may be recognised by the department as representative of the respective professional disciplines. Other panel members will be lay members to be drawn from a pool for this purpose. The pool of lay members will also be in place for a fixed term. On any panel drawn together to hear an appeal or dispute, there will be equal numbers of panel members other than the chair who have relevant discipline experience and lay members. The department will provide administrative support which will be provided by a team that is not the associated policy or operational term teams in respect of the discipline concerned. Panel members will receive fees and allowances for their attendance in line with those currently set by the Department of Finance. And I should explain that currently, in the case of most of the decisions made by one of the committees, the Pharmacy Practices Committee, if an individual wishes to make an appeal, they appeal to the existing National Appeal Panel. As the National Appeal Panel is well established and has, pro has a proven record in terms of withstanding legal challenges, it was decided that this panel should be maintained. It will, going forward, continue to hear appeals against decisions made by the Pharmacy Practices Committee, which will then be part of the department. The approach to appeals and disputes is therefore a two-panel approach, retention of the National Appeal Panel in its current form, and the establishment of a new separate Family Practitioner Services Independent Appeals Panel. The second appeals panel will deal with areas of appeal for the general medical practice, general dental practice, general optometry practice, and any community pharmacy appeals that are outside the scope of the National Appeals Panel. The Family Practitioner Services Independent Appeals Panel will replicate the good practice established by the National Appeal Panel, <coughs> excuse me, and will use the principles and protocols learned from the implementation and establishment of the National Appeals Panel. In terms of consultation, a consultation exercise was carried out from the 30th of July to the 24th of September 2021. This sought the views from a group of targeted consultees uh, representing family practitioner services, that's GPs, dentists, pharmaceutical and ophthalmic. Three responses from representatives groups were received within the consultation period and one after the consultation had closed. The responses indicated there was support for the broad policy intent that there is a requirement to provide an independent appeals panel. Other issues were raised by those that responded, such as recruitment, training, independence and governance of the panel. The department has considered these in the development of its processes. I should explain that while the numbers of responses was low, this was anticipated. This area of appeals does not generate a high volume of traffic. Having ma mapped the actual number of appeals received to what the new panel will be responsible for, the actual number of appeals received in the last five years have been in the low single figures. Examples of such appeals have been appeals brought by contractors in relation to primary medical performance lists, one appealing, remo uh, one appealing removal from the list, the other appealing conditions being applied to them to continue on that list. In terms of the regulations to facilitate the establishment of the independent appeal panel requires amendments to the following existing regulations. The dental charges regulations Northern Ireland 1989, the general dental services regulations Northern Ireland 1993, the health and personal social services primary medical services performance list regulations Northern Ireland 2004 and 2008, the Health and Personal Social Services General Medical Services Contracts Regulations Northern Ireland 2004 and the Health and Social Care Disciplinary Procedures Regulations Northern Ireland 2016. The statutory rule will incorporate the necessary amendments to these regulations which in the main are about updating references from regional board to the department and the department to the new appeals service. New regulations covering the new appeals panel will be added to these amendments and as I mentioned before, will be similar to those 
uh, there are provided for in the legislation, the existing legislation for the National Appeal Panel. Turning now to impact assessments, in reference to impact assessments, an equality screening exercise was undertaken and the screening document was shared with the consultees as part of the consultation process. Questions were also included in the consultation response document to gather views on the outcome of the screening exercises. No issues were raised by those that responded. A regulatory impact assessment was not carried out as the appeals panel would not result in costs or savings or increased fees on business, charities, social economy enterprises or voluntary bodies. These regulations apply only to the Department of Health in Northern Ireland and there are no anticipated EU implications as a result of the regulations. It is proposed that the rule will come into operation on the, on the 1st of April 2022 immediately after the powers contained in the Health and Social Care Northern Ireland Act 2022 are commenced. Uh, we are in the process of uh, drafting a statutory rule and this will be shared with the Health Committee when finalised. Although the numbers of actual appeals received in the last five years are in the low single figures, it is important that these regulations receive the necessary approvals and scrutiny and are made within the Assembly, assembly mandate. Um, I hope you found the detail provided helpful and we're happy to answer any questions you may have. Yeah, thank you, John. That that is that is useful. Um, I don't have a lot of questions. I suppose my only really concern is, or or that I would like to explore, is around the whole issue of involvement in the lay panels, um, and how you ensure that you have you know, a marginalised groups in there and patient voices, care voices. How is that managed within the lay panels, and is there an opportunity? to put those uh, patient voices and, and terror voices right at the heart of those panels in a way that they're not kind of overwhelmed by the professional you know, input into them. Uh, in terms of the, the lay members chair, what we're proposing, um, because there are such small numbers in terms of the actual appeals, as I've said, uh, in some cases it's less than one a year. So, you know, in terms of any experience of actual appeal panels, you know, if we were just um, going on the fact that uh, anybody new to this would get their experience from uh, uh, actually sitting in front of the, an appeals panel or being on that, there wouldn't be very, very much experience to be gained and they would lose it over the course of time. What we're uh, attempting or suggesting to do is that we will use the lay members from the national appeal panel that's already existing to cover these appeals as well. Um, as we go on, uh, I'm not 100% au fait with how the lay members were recruited at that time, but I'm quite happy to go back and provide further information if that's of use. Yeah, I, th I, think, I think it would be useful because I think we want to be always proactively seeing how we can improve that. And these are key junctures at which that, that, can, be, that can be looked at. So um, I, know, I know I had attended previous events with the Equality Commission where they pointed out that a lot of people on, on a lot of these panels sometimes don't reflect fully the, the so I think we should always be working very hard to try to build that into the system. So I would appreciate you coming back on that, uh, John. That would be useful. Thank you. Um, I'll go then to Pam Cameron. Pam, go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, um, panel on this. Um, I suppose I just wanted to check, I was going to ask you about how many appeals we received under uh, existing appeals mechanisms on average every year, but I think you pretty much said it was low single figures. That's on an annual basis. In some years there would be no appeals. Okay, so low or, or, or none, okay. Did You don't know what type of complaints are common? They were, uh, I think I said that the, the two medical ones were for a contractor who um, had been removed from the practitioner's list, or sorry, performance list, and the other one was from a, a practitioner who had had uh, conditions placed on them so that they could remain on the list. Okay, and um, so the new appeals process it will be effective from April 22? If the regulations okay. are there in time. Okay, and so how will the um, the transition be managed and, and the changes communicated to members of the affected professionals? That's a piece of work we have to do yet in terms of the uh, the operationalization of the actual regulations and the processes. Okay, I presume you'll be doing that soon given the time frame here? Yes, yeah. Okay, that's grand. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. 
Okay, thank you, Pam. Um, members, any other questions before I allow John and, and uh, John and Noreen to go ahead and then we can complete our discussion? I don't think. Have you any indications, Clerk? No, Chair, no further ones. Okay, well, listen, thank you, John and Noreen, for attending this afternoon and for uh, flagging that up. And we look forward to um, seeing, seeing how those, those issues that have been raised are, are worked into the, to the SL1 or into the SR. But we'll go ahead with our formal consideration now. And thank you. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Committee. Okay. Thank you. So, members, then, um, are members content that the Department go ahead and mix the SR? Yeah, I think members are broadly content, yeah. Okay, members, so the next three agenda items then, members, are LCMs that were deferred from last week's meeting. We have received correspondence at tab 9.3 of your table papers from the department to advise these LCMs are subsequent LCMs and therefore are not subject to the same reporting process for the committee. The committee is therefore not required to produce a report on the LCMs and the minister can move these in advance of the normal time scales. However, there is still a duty on the department to consult with the committee on the LCMs. And in, in that light, department officials are here to brief the committee on the individual LCMs. So the first one, the LCM in, in, in relation to the health and care bill, information about payments, etc., to persons in the health care sector. I refer members to tab nine of your pack, and I now welcome Andrew Dawson, who's Director of Quality, Safety and Improvement. Andrew, could you go ahead and brief the committee on this uh, LCM, please? Thank you. I'll just check that I have Alan, uh, Andrew online. Andrew, can you hear us okay? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, we're hearing you there now. Yep. Clear. Okay. Yeah, Andrew, so go ahead, please, with no, your, no your briefing. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. And thanks for your time um, today. Um, you, you'll be aware the Minister wrote to the committee on the 26th of January to advise of his intention to bring forward a legislative consent motion as soon as possible in respect of certain enabling uh, provisions relating to health payments to health and care professionals in the uh, Westminster Health and Care Bill. These provisions were finalised and tabled on the 24th of January at House of Lords Committee stage. Uh, I understand they were moved formally yesterday, and I understand that uh, Lord's report stage is scheduled to start week commencing the 28th of February. Turning to the policy background um, to this uh, consent motion, in February uh, 2018, the then uh, Health Secretary had established a, a medicines and medical device safety review to look into how to improve uh, primarily the way the NHS in England and the Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency responded to patient reported concerns more effectively. Um, this was uh, uh, led to the uh, Cumberledge Review, as it, as it was known, and uh, uh, the, that review team visited Northern Ireland in, in December 2018, and the evidence from uh, Northern Ireland patients was heard by the panel. The review itself centred on matters relating to three interventions. Uh, firstly, the use of pelvic mesh implants. Secondly, uh, the use of sodium valproate, uh, which was uh, a, a, which is an effective anti-epileptic drug, but which caused physical malformations, autism and developmental delay uh, in many children when it was taken by their mothers during pregnancy. Uh, and thirdly, uh, the third intervention then was uh, it related to hormone pregnancy tests such as Primados. Uh, these were withdrawn from the market in the late 1970s uh, as they were thought to be associated with birth defects and miscarriages. Uh, the panel's report, uh, First Do No Harm, was published on the 8th of July 2020 uh, and uh, the minister, our minister uh, made a statement uh, on that day uh, to, to welcome the report and to offer an apology to those patients in Northern Ireland who had been uh, affected by those interventions. In the first Do No Harm report, uh, there were a total of nine recommendations relevant to all three of those interventions that were set out by the review panel. Uh, the recommendations were targeted to improve patient safety and to provide help to those who have been harmed and to improve practice and learning. Uh, I should say the Minister uh, uh, intends shortly to issue a written statement to the Assembly on progress made to date across the whole, all of the nine recommendations in Northern Ireland. This legislative consent motion, however, relates to uh, one recommendation, Recommendation 8, uh, which uh, 
stated that transparency of payments made to clinicians needs to improve. The register of the GMC should be expanded to include a list of financial and non-pecuniary interests for all doctors, as, as well as doctors' particular clinical interests and their recognised and accredited specialisms. Uh, and then the salient point uh, part of that recommendation for this legislative consent motion was as follows. In addition, there should be mandatory reporting for pharmaceutical and medical device industries of payments made to teaching hospitals, research institutions and individual clinicians. Recommendation eight is, uh, as I said, being implemented in two parts and we're looking at the, the second part of that uh, for this legislative consent motion. Uh, and this provision is to uh, seek to address the perceived and real conflicts of interest in the provision of health care and treatment uh, where healthcare professionals and others have financial links with pharmaceutical and medical device companies. Um, and I suppose the, the, other, the other intention is that responsibility for transparency should not only lie with the medical profession but with the pharmaceutical and medical devices industries themselves. In terms of the vehicle then to, to, uh, to make this uh, provision, uh, we were advised uh, at official levels by our DHSC colleagues uh, in December um, just passed uh, that it was proposing to legislate to implement this part of Recommendation 8 on a UK-wide basis uh, by making amendments to the Health and Social Care Bill. And I say those amendments have been uh, formally moved uh, and there are six clauses which uh, in the bill which uh, relate to this legislative consent motion. The, the, I suppose the two most important are the enabling clauses uh, that which are firstly new clause 312b uh, of the bill to enable regulations to be made to require the reporting and publication of information about payments and other benefits provided to persons in the health care sector by manufacturers and suppliers of healthcare products. And the second enabling provision is in relation to enforcement uh, of the same. The, the other uh, clauses of note for us are uh, new clause 312D, which uh, importantly, I think to recognize the, the, the place and the importance of the default administrations requires the Secretary of State uh, for health and care to obtain the consent uh, of uh, Scottish Welsh ministers and the Department of Health in Northern Ireland before making provision within any devolved competence um, here. New clause 313B um, allows for those regulations to make different prov provision for different parts of the UK. Uh, and new clause 313C um, states, importantly again for scrutiny purposes, that any regulations to be made here uh, would be under the affirmative procedure. Um, finally then, new clause 314ZB uh, would extend uh, these powers to the whole of the United Kingdom. Uh, and we say the legislative consent uh, of the Assembly and indeed the other devolved legislatures is required as these provisions concern the transferred matter of health care. Turning to, the, and I'll be very brief here, just turning to the detail of the provisions. Um, the, the regulations refer to health care product, uh, which is defined as a medicine, medical device or other product which is supplied in the course of the provision of health care. Um, this will also include uh, so-called borderline substances, um, which is where, uh, where, where the DHSC consider that this is another area where products can be prescribed to patients and where therefore transfers of value uh, may influence decision making. So that would include, for example, dermatological and nutritional products, um, uh, oral nutritional supplements, specialist infant formulas, gluten-free products, and products for patients with metabolic conditions. Um, and the regulations themselves would require pharmaceutical companies, the manufacturers of those borderline substances and the manufacturers, importers and distributors of medical devices to report payments and other transfers of value that they make to teaching hospitals, research institutions and healthcare professionals in line with the, the uh, recommendation in the first Do No Harm report. The intention is for the legislation to capture payments relating to specific medicines, substances and devices and other payments which may not relate to a specific product. 
Uh, and then this would either be published by relevant companies on their websites or submitted to the DHSC for publication in a publicly available uh, database, uh, thereby ensuring uh, greater transparency uh, and trying to address some of the uh, real and perceived conflicts of interest that were highlighted in the first Do No Harm report. Uh, and it's, it's proposed that there would be an exception to the reporting requirement where it was felt that there was a, an adequate industry-run scheme already available. Uh, there are a number of voluntary reporting schemes for pharmaceutical companies and medical device manufacturers that are operated by trade bodies. These are not comprehensive. They don't cover all types of transfers of value. Um, they rely, they're voluntary and they rely on consent uh, for the names of people to be disclosed. Therefore, uh, the, the strengthening of, of requirements in statute, we would say, uh, would, uh, we would agree with DHSC would help to resolve those problems. Uh, in terms of consultation, the DHSC has consulted extensively with patient representatives and has also spoken with medicines and medical device associations to gather initial feedback uh, on, the, on these enabling provisions. Uh, they, DHSC uh, very much acknowledge that there's more to do to, to inform the development of regulations when they come to, to draft and make them and ensure that the needs of all patients, healthcare sector and industry uh, are heard and reflected. Uh, therefore, the UK government will be conducting a full public consultation in advance of making any regulations uh, and the devolved administrations, including ourselves, will be strongly involved in this work. Um, no adverse human rights or quality impacts uh, from these enabling provisions are considered. I would suggest that whenever we come uh, to legislate uh, for the regulations, that the Department of Health here will certainly uh, want to, to, to look very carefully at the, the would-be provisions of any regulations uh, in these regards too. There are no known financial implications, again, as these are enabling provisions. Uh, there may very well be um, uh, that uh, unforeseen ones are, are present that come, may come up when the secondary legislation is being uh, drafted. Uh, and again, there will be an assessment uh, made of, of, of potential costs uh, at, the time, at the appropriate time. Um, there has been no regulatory impact assessment, again, on these enabling pr pr provisions, but there will be one conducted before any regulations are made and once the detail of the policy is clear. And we have a commitment from DHSC that they will, we will work with them on that too. In conclusion, the Minister is supportive of the provisions um, and uh, is supportive of them being considered by the UK Parliament, uh, particularly considering the policy basis for the proposals, which was a report mainly in respect of the NHS in England, but applying uh, in principle to a lot of uh, our system here. Uh, importantly, and I think we as officials have, have worked uh, hard to try and get the, these um, provisions in, um, the consent of the Department of Health here is required before the making of any new regulations uh, within the Assembly's competence. Um, and I think we've originally, uh, there wasn't such a, a provision in, uh, it was, we then had one upgraded to consultation with the devolved administrations and now we, it's been upgraded again to consent, which I think is important just to reflect the interest of the devolved administrations. And also then uh, there's a further safeguard in that in making these regulations, there can be different provision across the, the different parts of the UK depending on, on uh, the, the local feedback received. Finally, then a, a final safeguard is that um, the regulations would be subject to the affirmative procedure in Parliament, so there would be an opportunity for parliamentarians in both houses then to uh, scrutinise any regulations to be made under these uh, enabling powers. Uh, so that's a brief run through. I'm happy to take any questions, Chair. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for speaking for speaking through that as best you could there, Andrew, to understand um, that there is a lot of detail in that. I have to say, I do welcome additional transparency, particularly in relation to um, the Cumberland report and the horrendous harms that have been caused to so many women and indeed men as a result of that. And I think it is welcome that we're tightening up and that there can be no lack of transparency or oversight in terms of where, where those issues are involved. So that's welcome. I also welcome the uh, the increased kind of uh, protection. I do generally have a concern around the ATMs in relation to the consultation or the impact here specifically, given that sometimes there may not be a full understanding of the, the nuances. However, I think that is welcome and there is that additional piece of scrutiny for, for the Assembly to come back to the Assembly here should regulation be changed. So I uh, just want to check, are there any other questions from members in relation to the ATM before we let Andrew go? 
no. So, okay, Andrew, that 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 appears, Grant. Thank you for briefing. Um, so we can we can go ahead with with that based on your based on the information you provided, and thank you for doing so. And take care. Thank Thanks, you very much. You see, bye. Okay. Okay, clerk. So I'll just check with you with yourself that. Uh, yeah, so we, we can come back to our, our uh, to our noting of them following the three briefings. We we'll go ahead and take the briefings, and we'll then come back to the individually after yeah, the briefings. Yes, Chair, just to say, we've just the one more briefing. Um, the third one's just a couple of responses that we got in um, from a previous okay. one. Thank you. So uh, the number 10 LCM, item 10 LCM in the Health and Care Bill is around the arm's length bodies members, the transfer function provision. We have discussed this before. It was deferred from last week, but I'd now like to welcome Joan Hardy from the Secondary Care Policy and Legislation. Uh, Joan, can you hear us okay? I can, Chair. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, hearing you fine yep. there. And also, Joan is being joined by Dr. Janice Bailey, who is Assistant Director in the HSC R&D Division. Can you hear us okay, Dr. Bailey? Yes, I can. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. So, Joan, I'll just check in with yourself that you're doing the presentation before we go to members' questions, if there are any. Um, yes, I'm happy to, to go ahead then. Okay, so... Yes, and good afternoon, Chair, and thank you for allowing us the opportunity to share an update on the ALB transfers of functions and um, answer any questions the committee may have. Um, you're aware from our, our past attendance here of the background to this, um, but just to bring you up to speed, the LCM was led in the Assembly Business Office on the 26th of January by the Minister of Health Understanding Order 42A, um, 2 and 9 and 6, the Assembly Agreement to the Health and Social Care Bill extending to Northern Ireland to provide for those provisions dealing with arm's length bodies, transfer of functions, powers. The bill was introduced in the House of Commons on the 6th of July 2021. The Department of Health sought to progress the ALB transfer of functions legislative consent motion in October 21. However, executive approval was not secured due to the concerns regarding potential future transfer of functions and the absence of a Northern Ireland consent clause. Health officials continue to engage with DHSC counterparts to find a resolution. An amendment was amendment to table to an evolved administration consent clause in relation to future transfer of functions, which touch on the devolved administration legislative competency, was proposed, was introduced onto the face of the bill on the 24th of January. The ALB transfer of functions provision relates to five bodies only, which perform UK-wide functions. This is a permissive power to enable the future transfer of functions between bodies to promote streaming and efficiency. The bodies noted in the scope of this power, which are mostly likely to impact ANI, are NHS Blood and Transplant, which is NHSBT, the Human Tissue Authority, HTA, and the Health Research Authority, the HRA. Future potential transfers of functions will be taken forward by secondary legislation. The tabled devolved administration consent amendment ensures NI consent will be required for any future transfer of functions which touch on NI legislative competency. And I'm happy to take any questions on NHSBT and HTA. And um, Janet would be happy to take any questions on the HRA. Okay, thank you. And am I am I correct? Is there is there an additional safeguard has been uh, could you just explain that in a little bit more detail, an additional safeguard where this will come back to the board administration, should there be any changes actually being undertaken? Yes, a clause has been tabled. Um which gives all devolved administrations instead of previously it was that they only had to consult, but now it has been proposed that it will be um it is sorry, I've just lost my, my space here. It's consent. So there is a consent clause added for all devolved administrations. So they must gain consent of each devolved administration for any change that impacts on their area of competency. And if that consent isn't agreed, then it will not be able to proceed. Okay, and I think that's that again, that's a welcome safeguard. In relation to the consultation process, would you be satisfied to either yourself um or, Joan be or Janice be satisfied with the, uh, the level of consultation here that, that people here are aware, those who may be impacted, have engaged on the, on the issue? Well, at the moment, Chair, there are no details of any planned proposals. So whilst um, DHSC has consulted with the main bodies and obviously with the policy in the different departments, there's no proposal to actually 
do anything at the moment. So they haven't consulted wider on that, but the main bodies and obviously the devolved administrations are all content with this and Scotland and Wales have already agreed to progress with their LCMs on the basis of the consent is included. And should there be proposals brought forward then, would the department here actively consult here and, and ensure that, the, that those rights are fed in? Is that how the process would work? Well, we haven't got down to that level of detail. There is an MOU being developed on how to handle issues like that, but certainly we would certainly be engaging because obviously, especially for um, transplants, you know, we cannot sustain a transplant system alone in Northern Ireland. We are part of the UK-wide one, so it's vitally important that any proposed change is fully consulted on to get the implications for our local service. Okay, okay. I see an indication from our Deputy Chair there. Pam, go ahead, please. Thanks, Chair, and thank you, uh, Joan and Janice for your time here today. Um, I suppose I'd just like a little bit more information on how this will all work um, and I'm wondering if you can give us a practical example of how the Secretary of State may wish to transfer a function to one of the six named bodies and in such a scenario um, what element would trigger um, the requirement for devolved consent? Well, anything that impacts on devolved competencies would have to be um, give consent. So for organ donation, for example, it is devolved, but we are choose to be part of the Human Tissue Authority. And that is done in a UK wide, well, it's done in England, Scotland, or sorry, England, Wales and Northern Ireland basis. But transplants are carried out in a UK wide basis. But in the legislation, there is um, that it's only about moving where things are done. It's not actually about the services. It's actually about moving responsibility within those organisations. So it's not actually about changing services or anything like that. So it is only about the mechanics of where the actual, um, maybe the organisation sits. There's no indication of anything at the moment about changing services to the population. Okay. Um, so is there is there anything then and around um, in terms of future alignment with the EU rather than GB? You know, in terms of standards, um, which underpin, say, uh, the supply of organs or blood or tissue. You know, is there could there be more of an issue coming out of um, this? Not in relation to this, but that issue is actually being dealt with separately. Um, we are working with the other devolved administrations to set up common frameworks to agree processes on how we would deal with areas where divergence may occur. And that is a separate stream of work and that, that's ongoing. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, do you see in terms of the consent then, and, and uh, in terms of how that consent is affected here? Is that done via the Assembly or via a Health Minister or a vote or how, how does the consent get expressed and processed? I, I'm sorry, I don't have any details on that, um, but an MOU is being developed of the how things would actually progress. So I can try and find out if, if we've got that level of detail as yet, but I know the MOU is still in development and obviously because this amendment has only recently been tabled, the MOU will obviously then have to be amended to take into consideration of that, of how actual the actual process will work. Okay, well, if you could, yeah, if you could get that, because the devil would be in the detail there, I think that, that would be, uh, so I appreciate that. If you could get that back to us, Joan, that would be great. Okay, um, so I, is there anything else you want to say, Joan, or um, in relation to it, I think that's really uh, us in that sense, or, or Janice, anything else you want to say? Oh, I'm happy. Thanks, Chair. Content. And um, just checking with Clark, there's no other indications, Clark, there. I don't have anything on my screen. No, Chair. Okay, so um, Janice and Joan, thank you for coming to the committee and for, for briefing us on that. Um, and we'll go ahead with our consideration and, and we can let you go. But thank you for now and please take care. Thank you. Thank you, Nye. So members then, um, 11 is LCM is the Health and Care Bill again, which is around the virginity testing and hymenoplasty that we were briefed on and discussed and, and raised questions on last week. I refer members to the papers of tab 11 of your pack. And uh, 
we will we 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 can then go ahead now to our our formal. So, members, really, I suppose, really, do members wish to note these LCMs at present, and they will be coming into the chamber in the coming weeks. So, our members can turn to note. Yeah, I think so. And as I outlined previously, there isn't a requirement on the committee to produce a report on these LCMs as their sub subsequent LCMs. However, I would suggest that we publish all related documents and the Hansard records onto the mm -hmm. committee's webpage for information for anyone who would wish it. Are members content that we do that? Yeah, content. Thank you, members. So, members, moving on then to uh, SL1 in, on pharmaceutical services, pharmaceutical services amendment regulations 2022. The department has advised that this proposed SR will amend existing pharmaceutical services regulations to make provision for community pharmacy to dispense prescriptions written by therapeutic radiographer independent prescribers, paramedic in independent prescribers, or dietitian supplementary prescribers. The regulations will also make provisions to support the rapid and effective rollout of a COVID-19 vaccine and the influenza flu uh, vaccine. The, uh, the SL1 is contained at tab 12.1 of the pack. So really what I want to find out from members today is do members wish to get a briefing on this matter next week or are members content as as, mm -hmm. uh, as has been presented, the department makes the rule. So it's really in relation to whether we take a briefing on this or are content the department make the rule. Can members give me your thoughts, please? Um, content to go ahead, members, without the briefing? Or the, the, you know, I, I, I think it's one that looks, it looks like a fairly positive, I have to say, I think, development. So it looks to me like one I, I would be inclined to be. I think it's good that we see a, that further spread of people who are able to do some of the very important uh, pieces of work um, I presume it would free up some of our, you know, some of our other medical professionals, additional support coming through. I think it also feeds into the whole issue of workforce that we've heard from the RCN on previous occasions about a uh, potential to move beyond uh, the, the top of your band within band five, particularly within nursing with half of our nurses. So any other thoughts? I, I, I'm broadly content, but if members want to get a briefing, we can schedule that. So Paula content to go ahead to know. Content with it, yeah. I think members are broadly content there that uh, that the department make the rule. It will come back to us as a, as a statutory rule, but I think members are broadly content that we do that. Yeah, thank you. Okay, members, moving on to correspondence then. There are no particular items I wish to draw members' attention to uh, today. Um, other than well, other than the one on long COVID, I'm not sure which 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 uh, which number that is. But on long COVID, and I know Paul, Paul, Paul raised this as well with the trusts, there is a lack of clarity around the uh, the levels, and I know the trusts have undertaken to give us some information. I think it will be useful to also get further information in the department in terms of uh, in terms of the levels and planning going forward. Um, Paul, do you want to say anything on that? I know you had raised it earlier. Yeah, no, thank you, Chair. I, I did submit a number of uh, assembly questions to the Minister and received the responses. And I, and I suppose taking the commentary this morning, like it is an evolving branch of medicine, so to speak. So, uh, But I do think that we just need to keep it under review because it seems like places like Germany, as I referenced, are leading or going uh, further quicker in terms of actual specialist treatment, where it seems at the minute a lot of ours is the assessment and, and almost like pain management and, and living with the condition as opposed to treating it. So I'm not sure whether we have time within this assembly term to get a briefing, but it's certainly something we do need to keep under watch. Thank you. Thank you. Members content with that? Yeah. And do members wish to raise any other items of correspondence on the main correspondence memo? No, thank you. Moving on to table papers then, there are some items in table papers correspondence I would like to draw members' attention to. There's a response there in the table papers from the Minister in relation to the Autism Bill and specifically in relation to Clause 4 and the annual funding reports, which is at tab 13.22. The response outlines that the provision of the clause is not a deliverable option and advising that the Minister may bring forward amendments to the clause. The committee has not proposed any amendments to the clause. So what's members' thoughts on that? Um, members, any, any thoughts on that issue? Uh, I should, go ahead, Paula. Yeah. Sorry, I think Pam wanted to get in there first. Go ahead, Pam. Thank you, Paula. Uh, go ahead, Pam. Yeah. 
Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Paula. No, I want to declare an interest, obviously, as the bill's sponsor. Um, I, I suppose I'll listen to the commentary around this yet, but I note that there hasn't been any amendments other than uh, the committee amendments so far for next week. So I presume the Minister's intending to amend at further stage. Yeah, can I check, Clerk? Is that would that be your understanding, Clerk? Um, j just to confirm, we haven't had any further amendments in, so um, it, usually consideration states it's just a matter of further amending um, to tidy up. So um, it, it'll be down to the minister to submit um, amendments, and then for the speaker to decide whether they're in scope or not. Okay. So, okay, Chair, I'm just sorry, yeah, just I was a bit, I was a bit confused because obviously we had the letter, um, so I expected to see amendments come from the department, um, but nothing's materialised. So, I don't know whether that means that they're planning not to amend or whether it's going to come at further consideration stage. Uh, given what Keith said now, that it's normally a tidying up exercise at um, further yeah. consideration. Chair, just to say, I'm sure the Minister during the debate may highlight what he's planning to do, but I think the time has passed for him to table any amendments on this one for consideration stage, because um, I think it's next Tuesday. Um, it is. So the time's passed to table any amendments for consideration stage, so I, I would presume the Minister will outline what he's going to do during that debate o on Tuesday. It, it might be a bit clearer after that, but... Um, that there hasn't been any um, amendments tabled by the minister on that one. Okay. Okay. Thank, thank you. I think that. Yeah. Thank you, Clerk and Paula. Um, thank you, Chair. I, I, I do appreciate that if you ever within the department um, outlined the difficulties with the annual um, statement or report on, on the financial allocations, and I suppose like previous um previously today you know something around three years would probably be preferable for them to be able to actually collate the information um uh, robustly so i appreciate the feedback and i do welcome i look forward to what the minister's going to say in his statement because i think that it's important we can't not um record um the information but i do understand why it's difficult in a, in a yearly budget or sorry yearly cycle Okay, so I think we're broadly content to to uh, to see how that develops within the, the debate on, on Tuesday. Yeah. Okay, members, at tab 13.24, there's correspondence from the Minister advising of his decision to initiate an independent review of children's social care services here in the North. The letter advises will commence this month and run for 16 months. The letter includes a copy of the terms of reference. So I suppose just in general, I do welcome I do welcome the review. Um, I'm not sure if 16 months does seem quite a long period of time for it, um, but maybe that's maybe that's um, based on on a, a reading of, of the, uh, the the most effective, you know. Uh, so I'm not I'm not clear why it's taken so long, but maybe there are good reasons for it. But certainly, it's an important and welcome review. Any other thoughts, members? Um, chair. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. You know, I, I, I just want to welcome it and, and I, I really specific, um, specifically want to draw out the Minister's reference there to the engagement with VoIPIC. Um, obviously, as a committee, we've engaged with them on a number of occasions, um, at the young people they work with, and it's very much welcomed and I hope they will be central to this process going forward. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay, thank you. And moving on, then, members, to forward work program, and we have touched upon forward work program within uh, within earlier matters arising, and those are noted, and those those are on the record, so we don't need to revisit. But I refer members to the forward work program at tab fourteen point one. Our members content to note the forward work program in general, as as and that there are additional items that have been raised earlier. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and just to inform members that there, we, we are moving to, and have a fairly good outline now, I think, in relation to the stakeholder event in Dungannon. Um, I'll just check with yourself, Clerk, if you have any information now or if you want to forward that or do you want to give yeah, a heads up? Sure, I, I will certainly forward it out to members, but essentially it's going to be on the, um, Thursday the 3rd of March um, in Dungannon and we're inviting the groups that um, we've talked about or have communicated with us over the past sort of six months or so that they'd be keen to, to come and speak to the committee. So we're getting in contact with them to see if they're available that then hopefully to have um, 
around four or six of them to, to come along and give short presentations to the committee. Um, but that will be on the on the third of, of March. Okay, and that'll be a useful way to uh, to try to reach out to some of those groups who have been trying to contact us, and hopefully we can do do what we can in that respect. So I'm looking forward to that. I have to say, uh, I'm looking forward to good uh, good engagement with those groups. That, that will be an interesting one, I think, for members. So members, a uh, final item or second penultimate item. Then any other business? Do members have any other business today? No, so I'll move then to date, time and place of the next meeting. Our next meeting will, a scheduled meeting at this point in time will be on Thursday the 17th of February 2022 at 9.30am by Starleaf. Thank you members and take care. Call my Agav.